Yeah. Let's go ahead. Hi, welcome to, um, it's uh, 5.32 now, so we're, we're going to call to order this sign commission meeting here in the city of Santa Clara, Utah on May 25th, 2023. Um, we'll start with the opening ceremonies. Uh, I'm going to, I, Logan Blake are going to give the, lead the Pledge of Allegiance and have, have the opening comments. Y'all please rise. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to be part of this community. We are grateful to be here tonight to discuss the, the needs and 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 things that need that are going on in our city, and we're grateful to be able to plan for the future and and um, plan for future needs that we have. We pray for Thy Spirit to be with us to bring peace to the room, to to bring peace to our neighborhood, and to bring and enlighten our minds to make good decisions. And we are grateful for the blessings that God's given to us. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, moving on to item number three, communications and appearances. I don't know if we have any of those this evening. We do not. Okay. Next, we'll move on to um, the item number 4A1. It's a public hearing for to consider a proposed PDR zone amendment and preliminary subdivision plat for the proposed South Village at Black Desert subdivision, about 43.77 acres. This, this is part of Black Desert um, plan community, and it's a preliminary plat as well. And um, I'm Pat, Patrick Manning is the applicant. Turn the time over to Jim. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner Blake. I'll go ahead and go through this item. As you indicated, it is a public hearing because we have a PDR zone amendment as well as a preliminary subdivision plat before you tonight. Um, this, this subdivision includes a total of 40 lots. Um, the total acreage of this site is 43.77 acres. Uh, this equates to a density of uh, 0 0.91 units per acre. So large lots similar to the Entrada subdivision uh, to the east, which is in St. George. These single family lots range in size from half an acre to 1.67 acres. Um, and so, what I want to do here is show you the original project plan uh, that went with the zoning for the property. We'll go down to that first. So this is the original project plan uh, for the overall area. And the area in question is area five. So you see area five here in blue, and then you see the golf course around it. And so that's area five and area A. Now, the golf course has moved a little bit. Uh, it's been under construction for quite some time and it's not exactly where this project plan shows it. Things have shifted a little bit. I will let the applicant and his engineer, Jared Bates, speak to that if the Planning Commission has more questions on that. But the golf course is wrapping up and almost complete. Uh, I wanted to bring that to your attention. So I'm gonna go through some of the items um, for preliminary subdivision plat. Um, and some of the things that we've identified. So the first thing I want to go to is I'm going to go back to the plat, but I'm going to go to the streets first just to give you an idea of how this is laying out. So um, you see a plat here. Uh, this is actually the roadway. And so the first part I have is public streets and dedications. So all required public streets have to meet public city standards. And so they have two cross sections here. One is a major collector, and that's Red Mountain Drive right here. Red Mountain Drive will be providing access from Pioneer Parkway, and that is 66 feet wide because it's a collector. And then we have Road E, which is going east, which connects to Red Mountain Drive. And you see it's extending a distance, and someday it will go off further to the north and to the east. But it's extending to the point where it gets to road C with the match line here. Now, road C is a local road, a 50 foot cross section. And so if I go to the page right before, you can see the match line right here. This is road C that's connecting to those two other roads that I just showed you and then providing the access into the subdivision itself. So all of these roads 
are required to be public streets. That includes a 50 foot cross section as well as a 50 foot radius cul-de-sac to meet public standards. Now, as far as uh, building setbacks and height, we can talk about that for a moment. Uh, you know, these are large lots. It's a PDR zone, so they'll be required to meet the minimum setback requirements. Now, the zone allows for a building height of up to 32 feet, uh, 35 feet. However, the applicant will be putting a building height restriction on the plat and within the CCNR is limiting the height to 28 feet. As you know, in Trout and some of the other areas in the vicinity are, are lower, lower heights. Um, the next item is a flag lot and double fronted lots. So lot seven here on your preliminary plat that you can see right here is a flag lot. And that's a lot that has a, a staff that's 25 feet wide. And then the flag portion is this area. It is the largest lot in the subdivision at 1.67 acres. However, the planning commission has to approve a flag lot and determine if it's efficient use of land. And if so, you know, the applicant would be required at a later date uh, to meet all flag lot requirements. So we have one flag lot out of the 40 lots shown on the preliminary plat. Now we also have three lots that are double fronted lots. Those are lots 21, 22, and 23. And those are these lots right here, 21, 22, and 23. You can see that there's a road B and a road A. The applicant has indicated that these lots will have frontage off of road A and the access will be from road A, but because they're double fronted, there's some options. And so um, these lots, they've selected the option of putting in a 25 foot rear yard setback rather than the typical 10 foot setback. This option is allowed as per chapter 1720110B, uh, and it's been selected by the developer rather than putting in a six foot wall into the natural lava area. And that's something that we don't want to see either because they're trying to preserve lava where they can in this area. Now, the next item is preservation of lava minimal disturbance. Uh, they're, you know, very selective in choosing the home placement and the sites and want to limit disturbance, allowing for, for preservation of lava areas. So each, each site to get a building permit, of course, they'll submit a site plan later on go through a process and they will also have CCNRs that will be enforced by the HOA uh, because uh, you know they do have some limitations. As you can see, we have the golf course in, this, in these areas here. Um, and you can see the golf course area around the subdivision where it is presently. There are notes about a golf course fly zone and that's been added to the plat uh, as requested by staff, kind of buyer beware, letting them know that there are golf balls and, you know, there is a golf course in the area that will be put into the CCNRs as well, um, which will be reviewed by staff at, at a later date when we get to final. Uh, they're proposing a multi-purpose trail. It's required uh, actually by our 2018 trails master plan. It's a 10 foot multi-purpose trail. Um, it will be. Take me to the next page. So the multi-purpose trail, you can see Tuacon Wash here. It's going to run along the east side of the of Red Mountain Drive, um, and then it's going to go across uh, Road E and run on the north side of Road E, providing access to other trails in the area as per our 2018 trails plan. I can show you in the cross section if you haven't had a chance to look at it that they're planning for it. Uh, it's right here. You can see in the cross section here, 66 foot street uh, section with trail. So they're planning for that 10 foot public trail as required along Red Mountain Drive, as well as the future road E. We do have a couple open space areas that were indicated on the plat um, that will be maintained by the HOA. Might be quicker just to go up. Apologize for the lag. Anyways, there are two open space areas on the plat. Um, we'll do it this way. Okay. So, um,
You see this area here, open space area two to remain undisturbed. That's just over an acre. That's between lot proposed lots 37 and 38. And then you have this open space area one, that's 1.16 acres and it runs uh, to the east of lots 30 through 36. So th these areas would be owned and maintained by the HOA. So you've got that buffer area there uh, from the road and to the homes over here and then this area here. So those will be maintained um, by the homeowners association. Um, and then I wanted to, to talk about the plat itself. So the plat is 40 lots. The previous preliminary plat was brought in with 42 lots and that included four lots in this area down here. So they've taken two lots away. Lot 37 has become a little bit larger as well as lot 38. And then this area of open space is, is portion where a couple of those lots were where they've gone down so this originally was lot 37 38 39 40 41 and 42 so they've reduced and removed two lots here making both 37 and 38 a little bit larger keeping the hoa maintained open space here and then having two lots here adjacent to an emergency access into the intrada area um, and so the building and fire code, uh, because of this, this project has been designed, it does not have a second point of ingress or egress on the public street system. You've got the turnarounds and cul-de-sacs, but a bit of a cul-de-sac dead in here because our street system is public in Santa Clara City and St. George, the Entrada street system is private. And so this has been worked out between the cities to allow for emergency vehicle access only. You know, in the event of emergency, that access would be granted. Um, and then also the IRC, the International Residential Code, um, in our building code and according to our fire marshal, uh, they will be required to do the NFPA 13D sprinkler system um, because of the long dead end access, and they've agreed to that. They're stepping up to, to a higher build and fire rating those buildings a little bit higher. Um, landscaping and entry features, if they're proposed, they have to meet our city ordinance 202205 for water efficiency and conservation. As you know, the culinary water availability, they have to work with the Washington County Water Conservancy District prior to final plat recordation to provide a will serve letter of verified documentation. They're required to install or put in or connect to a secondary water system for all outdoor water use as required. They will be required to submit project CCNRs uh, to city staff and legal counsel to review at final plat. Again, this is just a preliminary plat. We've talked in the past about dust control, submitting dust control plan and precautionary measures being needed to protect the general health, safety and welfare of residents in the vicinity. So those are all things that are required that we've talked about. Um, we're talking about now, we've talked about with other projects. So I showed you the original project plan. The applicant has submitted um, a revised project plan for the overall area. And so we're talking about area five tonight and area A. And so if you look at item number eight in your staff report, it talks about proposing revisions to the original area six, which is this area down here. And so the original plan I showed you, the conservation easement in area six was approximately 18.85 acres. The applicant is provo uh, proposing to revise area six of the project plan to include 13.3 acres within a conservation easement. So that's a reduction of approximately five acres. And again, the lots I just spoke about proposed lots 37, 38, 39, and 40, along with open space area two and the public road that lines up with Entrada. So it's these three, these two lots here, here, and then these lots here. So it's actually four lots the open space area and this lines up into that. It's part of that original area six. And so they'd be modifying that and providing this as the conservation easement or no build area in return for some allowances here. And so this is the overall area would reflect the current plan. And then this reflects the accurate depiction of the golf course as it's built and on the ground today. And so that is a decision that's going to need to be made by the city council as it will require an amendment to the development agreement for Black Desert. And so there was a site visit with the city council staff and, and the applicants on April 19th of 2023. 
our planning commission chair, Mark Hendrickson, uh, who isn't with us tonight, was at that as well. And so our city council is aware of the proposed area six revisions. So that's going to have to occur prior to final plat approval or concurrently with final plat approval. And this is something that we've discussed and talked about. If you have more questions, city legal counsel, Matt Enns is here to, uh, and can answer your questions on that. But that's where we're at in the process. Now, we did send property uh, notices to all property owners within 300 feet. We also posted the property with our banner and, and a QR code. Uh, the banner was put up two weeks before the meeting and the QR code was put up last Thursday. Uh, I've not received any written responses. I did get an email from an individual who, who may be here tonight that told me he'd be sending me an email if he couldn't attend the meeting and I have not received that. So I anticipate that he's here this evening and may have some comments for the planning commission. As far as the general plan consideration, this is medium density residential, and it also runs with the development agreement. It's very clear that medium density residential is allowed throughout the Black Desert community. Um, this is low density. This first phase of South Village is low density residential. This is not the medium density, which would allow for them to have a multifamily project if they chose to do so, but they're choosing with this first phase to do large lot single family. Um, we have met all state code requirements according to Title 109A205 for noticing, putting up a sign. And so our city staff recommendation is as follows. We recommend that the Planning Commission uh, rec uh, consider recommending the PDR zone amendment and preliminary plat for the South Village at Black Desert subdivision to the City Council subject to the conditions as outlined in the staff report. I do have a condition number nine that's been highlighted that states that a decision by the city council, which includes an amendment to the development agreement regarding area six, be decided on prior to or concurrently with the final plat approval. So that's what we had talked about. That's this change here versus the original project plan to the new project plan and uh, amending the development agreement. That's what I have, Commissioner Blake, at this point. Uh, the applicant and his engineer are here, and city legal counsel's here as well. And, and this item is a public hearing. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, trying to remember if we open the hearing up first. I think we do, right? Or Generally, we let the applicant, applicant. and then we open it up. Does the applicant want to add anything to the staff report? Thank you, Patrick Manning, applicant. Um, as uh, mentioned by, by Mr. McNulty, um, originally when we came in and did the development agreement, this area of five did have approximately 340 multifamily, uh, multi-story units um, in that section because it was very clear that the most important area to, to many uh, was the area six or the area that you see looking from the heights or from Pioneer Parkway across. And so not only are we looking to um, provide the conservation easement so that can never be built on in area six, we also decided to go low profile height, very low density on, on area five to help even further uh, protect the view sheds and the lava flow. Um, and we've Try to be, you know, really, really careful with that section. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess now we'll move on to, since this is a PD um, zone amendment, we'll we'll have a hold a public hearing for anyone that wants to um, speak about this particular application, um, and just remind people to try. Keep it within three minutes and to state their name and address for the record. So we'll open the public hearing now. My, na uh, my name is Travis Dowdell. I live at 2399 Kiva Trail and my property borders right on the area that we're talking about right there. I, so it's in, I live in Entrada. Um, only, only thing I really want to say is it, it, it appears to me that Black Desert has done a great job or a wonderful job with you guys, obviously creating some space and privacy around the resort. And so um, 
The issue that I have is with the other homeowners down here in this corner is that there used the original plan that Mr. McNulty mentioned was there was a fairway running right by our property adjacent to our to our land, our homes down there in that corner. But it moved. Don't know why it moved, but it did move and end up moving. And so what what now what they've done is they've brought in a road. So that was the original, that's the original, right? With the, the fairway that runs adjacent to the Entrada properties right down there in that, in that Southwest corner. So now what they've done is they brought in this road and they brought in um, 10 homes. And if you haven't been out there, you wouldn't really know that there's a beautiful ravine uh, of natural native lava with an elevated ridge that provides privacy between Entrada down there in that Southwest corner and the Black Desert Resort. And so what they're going to do is they're going to come in there and they're going to blast it out and they're going to remove all that native uh, lava. They're going to remove that privacy setback space and they're going to put a road and they're going to jam in a bunch of, I don't know, eight, 10 homes in there. It just seems very senseless when they have 600 acres. There's 600 acres and the rest of the, the property bordering the resort, uh, bordering Entrada has been set back. There's a lot of privacy and uh, it's been done in a really, a, a really nice comfortable way, but down here in the corner, what is the purpose in putting those eight to 10 homes down there bordering on our property lines with a road? I, I, I don't understand it. The other homeowners are upset about it. When they have 600 acres, they can't, they can't move those homes somewhere else. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. So anyway, I don't know why the fairway moved. I would love to hear an explanation for that, but why do we need those eight houses right there when they have 600 acres? Doesn't make sense. That's all I want to say. So I do have a question. I'm Devin Ferguson, the 3790 Nicholas Drive. I do have a question in regards to the dust mitigation. What is the penalty? If it's not controlled, as we saw it last year, quite a bit of dust was blown off of this development across Pioneer Parkway into the neighborhoods below, south of there. What is the penalty? Is there a penalty? And how is it enforced? Yeah, that's you would have to reach our public works director, Dustin Morrison, talk to him about that. That's okay. Yeah. Public Works is over that, and if there's going to be a penalty, they may work with our city engineer on any type of remediation, but I can't answer that. So, okay. but then, Dustin's here every day. He's the Public Works director. All right. So. And then also on the, there was a comment in there that the city council has already walked the side of the area six and didn't say they gave their approval, they just were aware of it? No, it was a site visit, a field trip. It was noticed as required of all type of meetings. And it's very common that elected officials will go out and take a look at a site and and walk around and understand the site, get to know it rather than making a decision. You know, they're being asked to make a decision to allow for a modification here. So in April, they went out there for uh, about an hour and a half in a work meeting just to see the site and understand the lava and the trail. They walked it. They were out there for a good amount of time. So I understand that part. I, mm -hmm. I don't understand is why you're trying to approve it to, uh, at the same time through city council and this committee without, are there other steps to that? It's a process. Yeah. That the city council hasn't made any decisions on this. Um, the first time that they will be asked to make a formal decision since they originally approved the golf course use would be uh, when this recommendation that, that's made tonight, one way or the other, goes to the city council. So yeah, when they walked the site before, it wasn't, it was a work meeting. There were no items for decision on the agenda. So they haven't, they haven't been asked to make any decisions yet on this. Yeah, I was just curious why it was listed on there. If, if if they're not skipping any steps, why is it there? So that's why. I yeah, it was just informational, just so they could get out on the site and see what the developer was doing. You know, get a, get more familiar with the, the lay of the land. Yep. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to comment on this particular item? Um, okay, seeing none, we'll we'll close the public hearing on 
item 4A1 and um, move on to, let's see, move on to the general business uh, recommendation to city council for item 5A1 from the planning commission. Um, I would like to hear the explanation of the one comment about, I, I believe about the road, the extra road, that sort of thing. If I the, think they're referring to these lots and the road access here. Yeah, sound the that. applicant so, wants to respond to that. Yeah, that would be. I think that'd be good to know in the history. The movement of the golf course and that. I I assume it's probably for that's that second access that that they need for this subdivision. But well, first of all, um, Santa Clara also needed a water line looped over to where that. Um, connects to the Entrada and, and Mr. McNulty can expand on that if you like. So we were using the road to also deliver the water line. The as far as the the golf course moving, we had uh, Tom Weiskopf um, design the course. Um, I recall back a year ago or a year and a half ago, um, him feeling we needed to move that move the golf course and it had something I don't honestly I don't remember. Um, Dan, do you remember why? Why he moved Hell Five? Yeah. So we just set the golf course. That's what I remember too. The golf course was going to be up a little bit higher, and we just wanted to set it down in the natural in the natural uh, ravine that it's it's in now. Okay. Any other discussion from the planning commission on this? Oh, we I'm closed sorry, the no. public here. No, the hearing's been closed. My my concern is we, and it goes through the process of the planning commission and the city council, and we approve a plat. Then it's done different, and it comes back to us later. It, it kind of puts us in a situation that makes it really tough. I can understand the resident that spoke on, you know, now all of a sudden a road popped up it makes it difficult for us where, and is there a process, Jim, that we, they build a plat different than what was originally approved? So, so the original approval that was given for the golf course use was a very, it was a very general, essentially like a bubble map. Um, and, and so there's, there's been no uh, plats approved or submitted to the city prior to this one. This is the first one um, for this part of the Black Desert project. So, um, you know, the, the, this is essentially the first opportunity for the city to comment and consider the, the proposed layout of lots because there's never been a submission previously that included the detail um, of where lots were gonna be located is basically what it comes down to. So, so that original one that we had is just kind of a, this is potentially where they are and then they can build it however they want. So once we give an approval and city council gives approval, they can just kind of do whatever they want and then bring it back and say, well, this is what we have been intending to do the whole time. We have, we, we approved the golf course use for them to put the golf course in and, and start operating it along with the approval of the original development agreement. But, but that approval didn't include approval of any plats. It didn't include any approval of where lots could be subdivided. That that's that's why we're going through this process now. For even the golf course itself, we just approved the use of a golf course or the use the land use for a golf course, and then they built the golf course. Well, that that's the process. Correct. Okay. So it was intended for the the area bubbles to be flexible in the original development agreement. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, it's kind thank of conceptual you. there at the beginning. Is yeah, with the we, we always had the knowledge and understanding that that you know the plats would come along at the appropriate time, and and the city would have the opportunity to to weigh in, you know, in the through the regular process of plat review and approval, and so that's where we're at now. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion. I can tell you, there's been a lot of discussion at the staff level about the location of lots, about what portions of the lava ought to be preserved. Um, 
you know, including questions of view shed and, you know, particular features in the lava and all those things, those there's been extensive discussions at the staff level with the developer kind of back and forth about those things. And, and what you have before you tonight is the develop what the developer has decided to submit as a result of those discussions. So not, not necessarily endorsed by the staff, but, Certainly, they've considered staff feedback. Curtis, do you remember when this was first presented in Area 6 was a large topic of the conversation? Yeah, we went and walked it. We had a meeting, and this was prior. I think James was probably the only one there besides myself. And we went and walked it, and we discussed specifically preserving those that lava right there along that walking trail that kind of, and that's lot 37 and 38, as deep as they are, they definitely get really close to that walking trail. And that was an item that we had talked about. And I believe, I don't remember if Mr. Manning was there with us, but there was somebody from the, the development or engineer was walking with us that day, but that was a, a giant concern. I know with the city council, I've heard mention of that being a concern also mm -hmm. is preserving that, that lava right there. Yeah, and if you remember, uh, Councilwoman Mathis was on the Planning Commission at the time. And, um, you know, it's been an issue that she's been concerned about and cognizant of. And, and frankly, that was one of the reasons we did the, the work meeting with the City Council is just to kind of bring them up to speed because it had been a while since they looked at it. Um, and, you know, to give them an opportunity to refresh their memories as to what it looks like and and what the developer is doing. So, so yeah, I mean, this, we're, we're just continuing that process and, and this, it, this process is just going to, this is going to be a long process because there's going to be multiple, multiple phases of black desert, you know, um, for this particular phase, this is, this is for the preliminary plat, you know, it'll have to come back for final plat too. So, um, you know, we're, we're just taking it one step at a time. So, so basically, we're looking at amending um, area six and reducing the size of it. Is that is that what we're doing or with that, or are we adopting this new bubble map as part of this with the? So, that would be the result of the of the ultimate final plat of approval of this South Village subdivision, um, which is why we've talked about also. Um, doing an amendment to the development agreement with along with that final plat approval if if the council wants to approve that um and so yes that that's that's inherent in in what you've been asked to look at tonight is that an approval of this subdivision in the configuration proposed by the developer would would change the boundary of area six um you know, the developer has articulated some reasons why they think that's appropriate and, and they're free to, you know, share those with you as well. Um, I, I think that, I think staff is, is generally comfortable with what's before you tonight in terms of, again, not an endorsement, but comfortable that, that what's before you is, um, is consistent with the spirit of, of what, the developer and the city have been working through for for this long long period of months um but you know it's it's that doesn't take away from you at all your your um your responsibility to make a recommendation to the city council one way or the other and uh and and to question the developer about you know the decisions that have been made to to get to to bring this you know, subdivision design to this point. Um, I will say, if this is helpful at all, that one reason the city has been um, open to an adjustment of the area six boundary is because we recognize the need for the second access road, um, which which exits right there on the, you know, the southeast uh, boundary of, of the project and which would be part of this plat. Um, the reason that's important is not just for access, but also for utility connections so that utilities can be looped. Um, and, and so whatever is approved, 
um, the city staff has has expressed support for making sure that there is a second access at that point, and that and that does impact area six. There's there's just no way around it. Um, we've talked about other options. We've talked about bringing a second access out to Pioneer Parkway, which would have an even bigger impact on area six. Mm -hmm. And would require you know changes to the trail and and i think would have more impact on view sheds and and that just raised a whole bunch of other issues so you know there's no question um that the developer and the staff are juggling a lot of different considerations here um and 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 those are all certainly things you can consider as you decide how to recommend this to the city council I think for me, the the thing that gives me a little heartburn on this, I think the whole project looks pretty good, but just lot 37 and 38 and their proximity to the existing trail. Um, you know, I don't know what the back of those properties are going to look like. Are there going to be any, I think, walls or anything there? But that's just, that's, I mean, the 30, this other one got changed into open space, which, and, you know, I don't want to take food out of Mr. Manning's children's mouths or anything, but I'm just thinking, you know, 37 and 38 were part of the open space. That helps protect that, that lava and that space right there by the trail. Yeah, I, I mean, you ride that, I rode that trail a few weeks ago, and if you go down closer to like where the Arboretum is, that's right in the back backyards of those other houses. I don't. Yeah. The type of these houses, I don't see that being an issue. I don't know what the space is. It looks like on this aerial that's on this, this is sheet three. There's a gap there still from the trail. Um, and I get the need for the the second access. I that's it seems like that's where the only place they could really put it. They couldn't connect it up to the other road. There's already houses and lots anywhere else in in Trada. Um. Jared, how old is this image that you have on this exhibit? Can you come to the podium, Jim? Please let us introduce yourself. Sorry, Jared Bates, Rosenberg Associates. Um, so to answer your question, I think it's 2022 is, is the aerial on this, this sheet here. Okay. It's got some grading on it. And then I, I wanted to clarify your question about, you know, where 37 and 38 are at. When we did the site walk with the city council, we went out and looked at that space Thoroughly, we went and so the way we, reason why we decided to remove those two lots that were there originally is because there was there were some some features that were there with the lava as far as kind of some hills and some some areas and those are the areas that we felt like hey these areas had to stay here we couldn't encroach onto them and so we felt like you know lot thirty eight was was significantly lower than the area you know to the west and so we were okay with that and same thing with thirty with thirty sorry that was thirty eight thirty seven. It's kind of tucked in behind below the trail as well too so the area that was really adjacent to the trail that really had an impact on the, on the view was uh that open space that's the open space now mm -hmm. as well as lot i guess it's lot 28 where we've decided to take a portion of that lot and made it undevelopable as well too okay. because of some areas you know with with ben shakespeare he's like these areas we want to be sure not to not to adjust and so that's why that was the feedback and that was the result of the meeting was removing two lots we really tried to address that as part of our, our walk. So what's the golf course fly zone in 37? Was that uh that's an area that, that potentially could have a, a golf ball could be so there. It's not unbuildable, it's just just a where sort of thing. there could be a golf ball there. And that might yeah. That's really just a it's really just a notice requirement okay. more than anything else. So then, that the property the property purchaser is aware that that's a hazard. What's and the What's the size of the gap between the road and the existing St. George Entrada? I think it's 20 feet. And the gap between the road and, and, and the Entrada on the road that runs north-south there, is it, is it 20 feet, 25 feet? What's, yeah, it's 20 feet. Yeah, we were originally had it closer to the, to the boundary, and we decided to move it for that same reason, to try to keep it, you know, so there wouldn't be any walls there. No retaining walls and minimize the grading adjacent to those lots because those lots are i think they're lower yeah all, the, all these things we've gone back with quite a bit with the staff trying to 
really optimized design to try to keep everybody's needs. One question I have for staff is, do we need 50 foot roads up in here? Could we reduce those down to the 45 since it is a PD? I mean, it's not, it's low density. So there's not like a lot of traffic. There's a dead end. I don't think. Our public works director has been very specific about the 50 foot road based on our new construction design standards that we just adopted for this one because of the large lots. So that's a discussion that would have to be held, but I can't answer that. I just, I would just think like for, for aesthetics and trying to minimize impact to the, the lava, it'd be better to have the, the 45 foots in here than especially when there's not, as, there's not a traffic concern. Most of this is single loaded. I well, you could, you could recommend that, you know, you could recommend that and then he can get involved between now and when city council discusses it and see how they feel about it. But I, I don't want to speak for the public works director. Okay. As you know, Logan, we spent months redoing those construction design standards, and he has his reasons for the 50-foot public road versus the 45, so that would have to require more discussion. Anything else from anybody? I don't know if this would be a, a question for Jared or Patrick, but if we, what would it do to the value of the lot if that property line, that southernmost property line on 37 and 38 was reduced 50 feet just to get it further away from that walking trail? That can have a substantial impact on property values because those lots, I think the one is almost an acre and a half and the other ones, they're giant lots. And obviously you can't build clear back up to that back property line. I'm just wondering if that, because there won't be walls to my understanding along that southern property line or will there? No, no walls. So if we push that back, is that an option or is that going to totally kill the value of those lots? It doesn't totally kill the value of the lots, but the setback there is already 30 feet. Is that right? It, it's 20, but we've cited the, the home. I think what we could say is that we would make sure there's a, a the minimum of a 30 foot setback off of the property line. So you get not only the distance between the trail and the property, but in another 30 feet. I I think, and, and like um, Jared said, that, that home lot sits about, I don't know, eight feet below the trail. And, you know, during that, at that section of trail, you're talking, I don't know, several hundred feet, whatever it is. And um, I, I struggle with doing one acre lots and low profile and cons do a conservation easement and, the trail has homes along it, you know, most of the way. And then we're individually singled out right there for something that is encroaches that trail more than that all over that trail system. So I, we, we want to be really sensitive. I think we've proven that. Um, uh, but I wouldn't want to push the property line. Logan, can I make one other comment? I, I think when I learned this, it was helpful for me just just for perspective. And I, you know, I'm not advocating for the developer here, but I, I do think this is this is worthwhile to understand. Um, and maybe you guys already, you know, gather this, but the way these lots are going to be developed is very much in the Entrada style or um, or Canta style, where you know, the, the disturbance on the lot itself is going to be kept to a minimum. Obviously, the city doesn't have control over that. It's the developer and the, you know, their their covenants that will have control over how that disturbance takes place. But on these really large lots, you know, they'll they'll have a big home on them and, you know, whatever driveways they they need. And uh, but but other than that, you know, they're they're largely going to remain undisturbed. Um, and, and I do think that changes the perspective a little bit because like was pointed out, you know, there's not going to be a wall on the perimeter. Um, the property lines will effectively be, you know, invisible. Um, and so what you'll see largely is lava almost all the way up to a, a low, you know, a, a low elevation home. And very little other disturbance other than that. And I, again, 
I'm just offering that as something that I, it hasn't been said yet, but I think that's important to understand that that's that that's the intent of the of the of the style of development. And Matt, that's why we had item number four in the report under preliminary plat preservation of lava and the minimal disturbance, because Mike Bylan and the group that they're involved in the location and disturbance of each individual lot and citing the potential future homes here. So. Which is a lot more in detail than typical a typical builder. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. um, as the same for me, it, it seems like that's kind of what needs to happen with as far as getting emergency access into the rest of these units. If you, if you didn't have this extra road going through there, it seems necessary. Lot 38, looking at the aerial, doesn't seem to have a whole lot of vertical seems like they have kind of picked out places that would have the most interest based on the walks that they've that they've said um you know riding that that trail it you come across a lot of houses already on it um i noticed it was kind of cool with the golf course there kind of added seemed like me kind of added to the to the view of it so i i don't really see a problem with kind of reducing area six because of those for those reasons down to that that location so as far as the overall overall plat, I think it looks good. I do have a I do want to I do like the idea of reducing the road sizes because it is a PD and we I think we have that flexibility in the in the code because it's low use. So I don't see a need to have the bigger streets, but I'm gonna talk to Dustin about that. But I just think if you start messing with those codes, it just opens a can of worms and that's what we're trying to get away from with all well, of the, the code allowed for members. smaller streets and PDs. It does. It does that, that. So what we went to is we have a 50 foot standard cross section. We have a 45 for a PD, but a lot of times it's a smaller scale project where, you know, these are large lots and a lot larger scale. And then we have a 55 foot cross section if they want to do park strips and sidewalks, but a PD does allow a public road at 45 feet. It's just that our public works director hasn't recommended that on this one at this point. So that's just a discussion that could be had. So it may be allowed. I just can't speak. I can't answer for him. And yeah, just for your reference, other guys too, is that the the other the Chaco bench, the ones that Jason St. George, they're private, obviously, but they're only like 30 feet wide or something there. But they're private, which we don't allow. Private, which we don't allow. But I just think, you know, if everybody's concerned about minimizing the impact of lava, smaller road would do that. It would take five feet off the road throughout the project. And we'd still have sidewalks on both sides and a public roadway. So it is an option. Any other discussion on the planning mission? Should we look for a motion then? Would we make a motion? Obviously, we couldn't make a motion with the contingency of reducing the street because that would still have to be a, a discussion, but we could, you could make, make a motion. A, right, recommending that city staff, including the public works director, consider a 45 foot right Look away. at reducing the road to 45 from here. Yeah, it's okay. still a public road. Um, my, I'll make a motion. I see where a city staff recommendation, obviously they have done their due diligence with staff and put a ton of work in and they're recommending it to be, uh, recommending the approval for the preliminary plat. So that's something I feel comfortable with also with everything they've done. So. I motion to recommend to the city council to consider the proposed PDR zone amendment and preliminary subdivision plat. Recommend to the city council for approval for the South Village at Black Desert subdivision with the, how many? 15. I know there was an arm load of. It'd be the update 15, to condition two. So the 15 conditions, so 15 conditions plus the 16 that's not written being that a discussion being have with the planning 
public works public, public works park. director on public limiting works. the street from 50 feet to 45. That was a mouthful. Did I do that accurately? That was fine. That I'll works. second, but do we have to call out the uh, bold section? The one yes. about... Oh, um, you know, honestly, I, I think it'd be worthwhile, if you don't mind, Jim, maybe can we just read through the, the conditions quickly? I, and I, you have them in front of you, but no one else here does. I think it might be worthwhile to just hear those. Okay. Uh, item one. Was, sorry, did we get a second on the motion? Or, okay, I didn't want to. Do we want to vote or are we good no, for no, me I to think, read? No, okay. I have a second. I think we can do this. So. All right. You make me read a lot. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take turns with you. That's fine. One, the applicant be required to comply with the recommendations from all city reviewing departments. Two, that the applicant be required to install public street improvements, which meet city standards. This includes Red Mountain Drive and Road E, which are 66 foot cross sections along with Road C, as well as interior public streets within the subdivision at a 50 foot cross section. Additionally, all cul-de-sacs within the subdivision are required to have a 50 foot radius, 100 foot diameter. Three, that the building setbacks for this subdivision meet the requirements of Chapter 1768 Plan Development Residential. That the building height for all homes in the subdivision be limited to 28 feet as proposed by the developer. That lot seven be approved as a flag lot. That lots 21, 22, and 23 be required to have a 25 foot rear yard setback because they're double fronted lots. Five, that each home in the subdivision be designed to maximize views and limit disturbance, allowing for the preservation of lava areas. Six, that the golf course fly zone note be required on the plat with associated language being required in the CCNRs. Seven, that a 10 foot multi purpose trail be required north of Tuacon Wash and adjacent to Red Mountain Drive, east side, and Rhodey, north side. Eight, that the two open space areas be maintained by the HOA. This includes area one, 1.16 acres, and area two, 1.04 acres. Nine, that a decision be uh, by the city council, which includes an amendment to the development agreement regarding area six be decided on prior to and concurrently, prior to or concurrently with final plat approval. 10, that the applicant is required to fire sprinkle all residential structures within the project with an IRC and FPA 13D sprinkler system, that emergency access be available from the southwest edge of the project adjacent to Entrada, that the applicant provides a key or Opticon override system uh, control to the uh, override system control to the fire department. Oh. One, one correction on that, that should be southeast, not southwest. But. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Sorry Lots of that. words, you got it. Um, and we talked about the Opticon override system. 11, that all landscaping individual lots and HOA maintained areas have to comply with city ordinance 2022-05, which is our water efficiency and conservation. 12, a will serve letter or other documentation from the Conservancy District. 13, that a secondary water system is required for all outdoor water use. 14, that a copy of the CCNRs for the project be submitted to, sit, to the city for review and approval of final plat submittal. 15, that the applicant provides a dust control plan prior to final plat recordation. And 16 uh, was the language as per Curtis about the public works director uh, considering uh, allowing a public street at 45 feet rather than the 50 feet. So all of those conditions are included in the motion that was made. Okay. So we got a, a motion by Commissioner Whitehead and a second by Commissioner Harris with emphasis on the the recommendations and specifically number nine that talks about the development agreement being amended and um, so I'll just do a, a roll call vote on that starting with Commissioner Whitehead aye 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 uh, passes unanimously and so we'll move on to the next item agenda which is. Item number 4A2, consider a proposed rezoning of property at 400 East and slash Patricia Drive and Pioneer Parkway, described as 18.09 acres. The applicant, Clayton Levitt, is proposing to rezone the property from R110 single family residential to the planned development residential PDR zone to allow for the proposed residential project that would include single family homes, multifamily townhomes, and amenities. Thank you, Commissioner Blake. Um, 
Um, I'm going to go through the items. Uh, this we're having another public hearing. Our last public hearing on this item was March 23rd of 2023. Uh, city staff went through every item in a lot of detail. So I'm going to try to go through the updates and detail those and, and not go as thoroughly through some of the other items that remain the same or have not changed. We also have the applicant here, uh, Clayton Levitt with Oak Creek that would like to speak to the item and, and fill in some of the spots if, if, if I miss. So we did have a public hearing uh, by the Planning Commission on March 23rd of 2023. A motion was made to recommend approval to the City Council. However, the vote on the motion ended in a three to three tie. No other substitute motion was made or voted on. Therefore, no recommendation was provided um, by the Planning Commission on the item. And so the minutes from that meeting are in your packet. And then on a public uh, meeting for this item uh, was held by the City Council on April 12th of 2023. A motion was made by the City Council to table the item to allow the applicant to work with City staff, incorporate some of the City Council com uh, comments and propose a new layout um, with lower density. And the motion was passed with a three to two vote. And those minutes are also within your packet. So I hope you've had a chance to review those. Now, before you and for the public to see, this is the new project plan. This includes 133 units on 18.09 acres of property. This equates to a density of 7.35 units per acre. This includes a total of 82 single family lots or pad and pad lots along with 51 multifamily townhomes. Now the previous plan included 144 units. So the difference is 11 units. That included 69 uh, single family lots or pad lots and 75 multifamily townhomes. And that equated to a density of 7.96 units per acre. So the reduction in, in units here is approximately 8%, uh, the 11 units that have been dropped um, between the two, the two different plans. And so we talked about the residential count already, uh, just so you know, and these are numbers and percentages. The new plan includes 62% single family and 38% multifamily. So those are the percentages. And you see that right down here on the bottom. And so we now have 30 rear load townhomes. So these are the brown units. 21 front load, one story townhomes are the yellow units. And then the single family detached uh, are 82 units. So that breakdown is 62% to 38%. Now the previous plan that was reviewed by the planning commission on March 23rd included 48% single family and 52% multifamily. So the breakdown was a little bit different. Now, just to be a little more specific on these lots, and, and so everybody understands, and, and I think most people do, but I'm just going to go through it. Lots 1 through 14 have frontage on Patricia Drive and would be oriented to Patricia Drive. Those are bigger lots. Lots 1 through 7 are approximately 8,000 square foot lots, and lots 8 through 14 are approximately 6,000 square foot lots, so a little bit larger lots. And then we have the typical pad lot. Um, these bigger lots here that you see right through here and back onto Pioneer Parkway as well as 400 East, there's 40 of those. So taking one step back, we have 14 single family, a little bit larger lots adjacent to Patricia Drive. We then have 40 pad lots proposed, which are the bigger pad lots. And then there are 28 narrow pad lots proposed. So those are the two-story type of construction homes that we talked about last time. And so um, I'm going to quickly go to the elevations here. Um, and so the single family lots, you could have the option of the one story Rambler uh, that you see before you. There would also be an option of a two story home that you see before you with, with uh, you know, different elevations and different materials. The townhomes, the two-story townhomes, this would be the configuration that you would see. Uh, you know, a two-story townhome uh, with a rear load type of driveway. Um, these would be the side elevations, the front elevations in 3D, which we discussed at the last meeting. Um, and then here's another, you know, kind of a front view 3D perspective with that outdoor 
open space area or outdoor patio that you would see on the fronts with the rear load garages. Um, then here's a color rendering of that building, some side views, and then the front view again in color. And then these are the one story townhome units that are proposed along 400 and a little bit within the interior of the project. Um, I think we have this one and it's really small, so we'll open it up. So that gives you an idea. That gives you an idea there of what's uh, being proposed. Oh boy. <laughs> so you can see those there. Those are a little bit smaller, about 1,000 to 1,100 square feet, one car garage with two car driveway to meet parking code requirements. Um, And then these are the narrow padlock homes, like we talked about last time, uh, approximately 25 feet wide, 17 to 1800 square feet in size, uh, including a two car garage. And so we've got some different options here where they're proposing some different options. I believe there's five different options of, of the narrow lot home. Um, and then this gets into materials with the hardy, the brick and the stone and, and stucco. Um, not so much, but you see a little bit of stucco there, the hardy and, and um, the stone. I want to go to the materials boards. They submitted material boards, which show for the single family homes, you've got brick options. So there's three different brick options with color palettes. And then you go to the single family homes, there are stone options, three different stone options with different color palettes. And then the townhomes, uh, you know, you've got the different options. There's a package with stone and a package with brick. Um, so going through those, now I'm going to go, uh, a little bit to landscape plans and open space. Just waiting on the machine here. This is kind of an overall plan that gives you an idea of some of the open space areas. As you know, there's a pool and his and her restrooms as well as pickleball courts proposed. And then the central open space areas, both here and here. Uh, with gazebos and picnic areas. And then this is just more of an open ball field, maybe to allow for soccer practice and some barbecue court, uh, barbecue, uh, not courts, but areas. Um, you can see some of the individual unit landscaping in the case of a townhome. So you do see some green, but it's limited. Um, and then you see trees and a lot of drips. Um, and so that's to meet the ordinance and the criteria throughout our region in Washington County, because water is very precious. Another uh, option of the main amenities plan or drawing that shows you the pool, uh, the facilities, and then the outdoor lounging areas. Um, if I go back to the overall plan here, we just have so many exhibits and thank you for being patient, both planning commission, public and the applicant. Uh, we have a phasing plan here. We've talked about the phasing plans in the past. So they're proposing multiple phases. Um, there's a 1A, which would be the units adjacent to Patricia Drive. There's a 1B, which would be interior pad lots and the restrooms and the pool. Phase two uh, would include some open space, more pad lots and the pickleball facility. Phase three is uh, all units. Phase four would be units backing onto Pioneer as well as this center green court and some of that amenity would be put in. Phase five are townhomes uh, with a rear load orientation off of Tuscany and front load to the interior and then the uh, detention basin area. And then phase six uh, would be more open space area here as well as uh, these townhome units themselves. So. Those are the seven different phases because we have a 1B, a 1A and a 1B. Um, project amenities, like we talked about, a lot of it would be put in with phase 1B, the restrooms, the pool, the hot tub, outdoor seating. And then phase two includes the pickleball courts and then other phases as we move forward. Um, briefly, I just wanted to indicate that here, it's not easy to see, but we do have our 2018 trails master plan and an eight foot trail is required out here to tie in uh, to Tuscany to the north, and that would be required. Again, they have to meet the landscape water efficiency. That's always a concern here, you know, that they're complying with our ordinance 2022-05, and secondary water will be required or would be required for all outdoor water use. 
We talked about cross sections earlier with the previous project at Black Desert being at 50. This one is a P, you know, it's a PDR. They're doing the 45 foot cross section. It's a smaller scale project. As you can see, that requires the asphalt, the curb and gutter, and a five foot sidewalk on each side. And those sidewalks allow for everybody that could potentially live in this project if it were to be approved to be able to walk throughout the project and have access to the walkways, providing access to the open space and amenity areas. Um, so that's a public cross section. Uh, the only area that's not a public cross section is, are these two private driveways here adjacent to lots 38 and 39 and 59 and 60. Those are 26 foot wide asphalt private driveways that would be required for the access there. Um, as far as parking goes, uh, there's quite a bit of parking uh, within the project itself. And I know that question's come up, but I can tell you that the project plan includes 203 parking spaces for 51 multifamily townhome units. This equates to four spaces per unit. That's double the code requirement of two spaces, one covered, one uncovered. And then um, the chapter also requires um, uh, parking for single family homes and the pad lots. Each one of those is designed with a two car garage and a two car driveway. The only one, the only units that don't have capacity for four cars are the single car garage, single level townhomes. They have parking for three, one covered with the garage and two on the driveway. Um, so they do meet the parking code requirement as far as the project plan at this point in time. Uh, a soils report, a geotechnical report, the subsurface investigation was done by applied geotechnical. It appears that expansive clay was encountered in multiple site locations, both north and south. However, the site is suitable to support residential slab on grade construction, provided that the report recommendations are implemented during construction. So that's later down the line, but we do have a geotech. A traffic study was also done, a traffic impact study by Hales Engineering it was submitted for the property. Uh, the two project accesses were assumed, which resulted in a level of uh, acceptable level of service at intersections. Uh, however, a third access was also considered on Patricia Drive and discussed. Uh, that's gone away with the redesign and the single family homes fronting Patricia, the like uses across the street rather than plugging another access point here. Um, it found level of a, a service acceptable for 144 units. Uh, they've now trimmed it down to 133, so a reduction of 11. Uh, updated project narrative is in your packet. Uh, you can ask the applicant about that. As far as a block privacy wall, a six foot privacy wall is required on both long uh, backing onto Pioneer Parkway and 400 East. So the units that back onto those two roadways. And then on occupancy, this is an item that came up on April 12th, 2023 with the city council. And the council asked the applicant about a minimum number of owner occupied multifamily townhomes. At that time, the applicant agreed that a minimum of 50% of the multifamily townhome units would be owner occupied. This requirement would need to be put in the future CCNRs for, for the project later on down the line if approved. Um, as far as rezoning consideration goes, we went through that very thoroughly back on March 23rd. It appears that the applicant meets that criteria with the exception of item C. And item C says, are there substantial reasons why the property cannot or should not be used as currently zoned? There are not. It's currently zoned R110. The applicant has decided to submit an application asking for a rezone of property allowing for medium density residential as per the general plan that we have on the books. And so that's the process that, that he has chosen to pursue. Um, as far as our general plan consideration, the general plan has identified the property as medium density residential. And the proposed project plan and rezoning application includes small lot, single family homes, townhomes, open space and amenities for residents. This proposed use of property is encouraged by the general plan. So the layout, the design, the project does comply with the general plan and the medium density land use designation. Notices were sent to property owners within 300 feet of the property. The property was also posted as per state code. Um, previously, we had received some emails which were sent uh, to the planning commission prior to the March 23rd, 2023 meeting. 
Additionally, a resident petition was submitted at the March 23rd, 2023 public hearing. Um, and with another one being submitted after the public hearing, and you have those. The, the petitions were submitted to you. There's a funny skip between each page, but those addresses were also verified by our city recorder, um, Chris Shelley, and they are accurate. We do meet state statute section 109A205 for the public hearing notices. We were sent those out 10 days prior to the public hearing. We did post the property. We have put it on the state website as well as city website and posted in public spaces. You know, we have our banner signs out there that we have had done. Uh, state code doesn't technically require that, but we've done these large banners to draw attention to the site. And then a week before the meeting, we put a QR code banner up next to it so they have access to the city website for the material. So at this point, city staff recommends that the Planning Commission review the submitted rezoning application and project plan to determine if the application is complete. If the application is determined to be complete, city staff would recommend that the Planning Commission forward a recommendation to the City Council for their review and consideration of the application subject to the following conditions. And so we have 15 of those. Uh, we have added, we have updated a couple conditions. Condition number two talks about 133 units. Last time it was 144. Condition number five talks about the open space, which has increased slightly. Last time it was just under 34%. Now it's just under 35. Condition 10 deals with the parking. The number of parking spaces for the multifamily units has changed based on the reduction in those type of units. And then the condition that a minimum of 50% of the multifamily townhomes be owner occupied. And then condition 15, uh, property rezoning complying with the chapter accepting item C. Again, there are not substantial reasons why the property cannot or should not be used as currently zoned. However, the applicant intends to do a PD subdivision with both single family and multifamily townhomes as per the MDR land use designation of the general plan. So he has elected to pursue that because the general plan allows for it. And then we have three findings and I'll read those briefly. One, that the rezoning is compliant with the Santa Clara City General Plan, section 3.4.1 residential land uses, medium density residential. Two, the medium density land use designation allows for townhomes, multifamily units, uh, multi-unit buildings, and small single family structures on small lots. And three, that other properties in the immediate vicinity, both north and south of the site, are zoned plan development residential PDR. So that's what I have at this point. The applicant is here and would like to address the commission and city legal council, Matt Ens is here for questions as well. Thank you. Hey, Jim, one question real quick on Condition number 14 of the 50% owner occupied, we don't have an ordinance that governs that. So would that still be a condition or would that be something we'd put a condition on the CCNRs? How would that be conditioned? Yeah, you 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 hit it on the head. We basically the condition would be that they would have uh, a requirement in their CCNRs or a restriction on rentals that would that would uh, impose a 50% owner occupant that would be enforced by the they would have to enforce homeowner association, the homeowners not association. The yeah the city doesn't have the capacity to to enforce that so okay um but the applicant had to come up and address the commission uh clayton levitt uh Hope you all know me by now. Um, so, uh, I'm speaking into the mic. It's oh, I <laughs> raise the mic too. Sorry. Um, so, uh, I think everyone kind of has an idea of what we've uh, we've done in the past and what. Uh, we'd like just to talk a little bit about this new plan um, as we needed to make uh, some significant changes. We eliminated 24 townhomes. And the areas of concern with the council, with the planning, was the, the density. It's too tight. So we took out the townhomes by the pool area, put single-family homes there. We also um, took a lot of, actually, we took out five of the two-story townhomes 
in the center section to the north and uh, created more open space there. So it was more open with the single family on the uh, east side of that, excuse me, the uh, single family on the west side um, and the one story towns, which are opening up that space even more so on the east side of that. Um, that, that was our goal is to uh, eliminate, uh, like they say, the 24 townhomes and added 13 single family homes to the project, which we're pretty excited about. Um, we've taken into consideration the city council as well as the city staff suggestions and recommendations and put them into this plan. Uh, done everything they've asked us to do. The reason why it's so important to have a PDR zoning is because this is a transitional piece. You have the multifamily to the north, um, you have which is a PDR zoning, and you have the PDR single family to the south, and then to the east, you have the uh, single family residence. And so in order to buffer all three areas, um, we needed to do a, a planned development community. And so as we felt it was very important, if, if you'd like to shift that map down just a little bit, uh, the uh, other way, maybe just to show those single family residents along Patricia, we felt that was uh, important to buffer. Well, that's it. Oh, there you go. Uh, we felt it was important to buffer the residents in, on the Heights West there um, with those single family homes. We feel like being able to do the PDR zoning on this transitional piece al allowed these transitions of densities to progress from a higher density of nine to 10 to a lower density of five uh, to three to the, to the east. And so that's why we've buffered each of those areas the way we've done that. Our ultimate goal is to, is to be able to sell homes to, to Santa Clara residents. As you know, um, right now, uh, quarter acre lots or even 8,000 square foot lots are, uh, along with a single family home are, are going for 800,000 and 900,000. Nobody in Santa Clara can afford that. Another reason why it doesn't make sense to keep this as R110. Um, the other big benefit we feel is it allows in this plan to have various types of homes in the project from 1,000 square feet up to 3,500 square feet. So a lot of different residents in the community would be able to live here. Now we've heard uh, quite a few comments and concerns from our residents and uh, we feel like we've kind of been grouped in to all this height. They label it as high density to the north. Um, our project is, is medium density and it's at the lower scale of the medium density at 7.35. So it kind of is, is right in between and, and because of the buffering that we're trying to accomplish to accommodate the neighbors on all sides of us. Um, parking's been addressed. We, uh, we've changed our plan to, to make better parking. Traffic's been addressed. We've done a traffic study that supports our plan. And, and uh, it actually is, uh, it, it is, it is at a higher level of accept, acceptability. My mouth's gone dry. <clears throat> another, another big concern was the transient nature of and concern of our project. There would be no sense of community. We as a developer don't want that either. We want a sense of community. And having 82 homes, uh, people living here will be invested in the community. Um, uh, as was mentioned, Another 50% of the townhomes would be owner occupied. So they would be invested in the community. So we have a, 
a large, large part of our project that would want to be here and, and be part of our of Santa Clara. Uh, I know there's concerns about property values. We as a developer also have concern about property values. We feel that our homes that, are, that would be built along Patricia Drive uh, would be much higher in a sales price than what's across the street on Patricia Drive. Um, because right now, if you can find a lot for under $250,000, uh, a quarter acre lot, I'd like you to show me where it's at because it's, it's not available. Um, and by the time you put a, a single family house on top of that quarter acre lot, you're going to be in the 800, 700 to $900,000 range. And so we're concerned. We feel like we're going to increase the property values of the residents to the east that are concerned about their property values. Um, we're going to build a quality townhome product because our single family homes are going to be right next door to it. I think you saw the elevations. I don't think I've heard of anybody that everyone's told us they liked them and that they were uh, uh, a step above everything around us. The other concern was density, and we feel that we've taken out a lot of the density that. Uh, was asked of us and uh, we still need to have, uh, we want that sense of the community. We want to have a, a great area so people can go to the pickleball courts, get to know their neighbors, go to the swimming pool and build a, a resort style type swimming pool. Um, so, if, so if you're asking us to do R110 and keep it R110, what you're really asking us to do is, uh, is to eliminate the residents in Santa Clara, they can't afford it. They can't afford a uh, 700 to 900 square foot home. There's, there's, a, there's a home, a new home built in an older section. And mind you, uh, Heights West is going on 20 years old. Um, it's a 600, they've listed it at 600,000. It's been on the market for six months. They can't sell it. Yeah, um, it's a nice home, very nice, 2,100 square feet. Um, so that's that's kind of the market. And we, I think we need to be a little bit more realistic as far as what people can afford. I think most of the residents behind me, um, anyone that bought their home before 2020, they probably bought it at 350,000 to 600,000 because that's what the residents of Santa Clara can afford. And we're putting together a project for the residents of Santa Clara so that they can afford that. That's, that's where we want to be at 350 to 650. Um, um, be happy to answer any questions or um, I, there's a couple of quick points I probably ought to how to make that I didn't. Um, we want to hire a professional property management company. I don't own a professional management company, but we want to hire one that can oversee and enforce our CCNRs and make sure uh, that everything's tidy and clean and kept up. And it's it's important for us to to build. Uh, a community that people can be proud of and they, they can call home and it's going to be a first class development and that'll allow a variety of residents to be able to live there. I think I've covered most of those things. There might be a couple other questions. Maybe I could answer at the end of the, the uh, public hearing. I'd like to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess moving on now, we will proceed to open the public hearing for item number 4A2, this rezoning of the property at Patricia Drive. Um, as I stated before, all those that want to come speak can speak as long as um, we give you three minutes. Please state your name and address and 
and try to keep your comments not repetitive as much as possible. We I know we've done this before, and we're, we're glad to hear from you again and, and to listen to what your concerns are for this project. I've got a timer, so. Ann Hughes, two 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 three Sharon Drive. That's in the Village on the Heights. No rezoning. How many meetings do we have to attend to keep? Ma'am, we do. I'm sorry, ma'am. We would ask that you. Ma'am, we would ask that you put the sign away. Thank you. Appreciate well, and it. now that you've all. Seen I mean, we have voiced our opinions. Everyone on every side have said no to rezoning. But you never listen to us. You just have him change and change and change and change. Well, we would like a few more changes. We'd like every single house up there to be a single home. And then we would be happy. Why couldn't we vote on this? Let everybody in all those neighborhoods, we have signed petitions. We have come to meetings and yet he comes up, he's provided something gorgeous, beautiful, wonderful, but it needs to go to some other piece of property that is zoned for this type of a development. If we could vote on this, I and everyone in my subdivision that I have talked to, all my friends and neighbors, we all want it to stay single homes. We do not want it rezoned, but I don't know how many times we can tell you that because you don't listen to us or someone doesn't listen. If we could vote on it, there would be no question that this is not to be rezoned. And I think that's why we all come out here is because we don't want it to be rezoned. Thank you. Doug Wells, 3842 Nicholas Drive in uh, Santa Clara Heights. Uh, I'm also in favor of no rezoning. Um, giving credence to those people who have held your position in the past and the city council, they established this area as uh, residential, R10, um, to create the atmosphere that Santa Clara is known for, residential housing, stable families staying there a long time. Why change that zoning? So on three sides of this property, there are all um, nice lots, uh, 10 and 10,000 and 6,000 and heritage estates in Ivans and uh, Desert Rose, magnificent developments. Um, why would you smash in the middle of that this a bunch of townhomes, uh, medium density, if he wants to call it that. Secondly, I, you shouldn't change the zoning on the basis of um, Mr. Levitt's purchase of the property. He purchased the property. It was zoned R110. He knew that when he made the purchase. Daddy used to say, you make your bed, you lie in it. Um, but uh, really, that would create a beautiful area and Santa Clara's limited land left to have beautiful residential communities. So this is this is one area that could be a beautiful area. Uh, finally, um, there's talk about trying to make some more affordable houses. It, it's a misnomer. They're not going to be affordable. He builds a townhome. That townhome, by the time he gets it built, is probably going to be four hundred thousand plus. The better thing would be to build a community where the people that are now in townhomes could move up to a nice area. So I encourage you to not encourage nor support a rezoning. Kevin Ferguson, 3790 Nicholas Drive. Uh, try not to repeat, but yes, this was originally zoned MDR, right? Originally zoned as an MDR, correct? It was general, general plan, plan as MDR. General plan doesn't say that it has to ever be changed. 
just because of a de plan development that is wanted to be there. So I'm asking you not to change it just because of personal benefit on, on the new purchaser. Uh, he, he mentioned, Clayton mentioned that the, the valuation of, of the property for sale in, in the neighborhood to the east, uh, not selling, that's partially dictated because of the interest rates have gone up and that's going to affect the purchase of the homes in his property as well. So that's, you can't even take that into consideration. Um, the selling price of, of a quarter acre lot, as he mentioned, at eight or nine hundred thousand dollars, is dictated by the seller, not by or by the market. But if he wanted to make a, homes affordable, he could do that on his own and lower the, the the lot price for that purpose. I've lived here since 2010. Seen lots of changes, elevations of these these new townhomes will take away from my view from my back of my house. I enjoy the sunsets. I will lose them if it goes two story with these townhomes. I don't want that because of that. And I'm invested in this, this community fully. Uh, I've supported the Snow Canyon High School through and through. I'm a big fan of it, all, their, all their programs. And these are not designed for families to grow up and raise families in. Townhomes are stepping stones to another home. They need to be homes that are big enough for people to play in their yard and raise the number of kids that they need. So please take that into consideration, guys. Michael Lee, I live at 2312 Jacob Drive. Thank you guys very much for the opportunity to have a public voice in this meeting. Uh, my, my concerns that I'd like to bring up today is just about how, if you, if you look at a map, every parcel, every inch of, of what's around my neighborhood over there um, on the northwest side of town is being converted into higher or, or medium density housing. Uh, Mr. Levitt is correct that his project is being grouped in, um, for better or worse, with Every other project that has been built in that little corner of Santa Clara, we've watched as every piece of vacant property has been turned into either vacation rentals, or townhomes, or apartments. And talking very sincerely and, and without any animus, uh, I, I do not fault Mr. Levitt at all for wanting to make a profit. I spent 10 years in the construction sector attending meetings exactly like this on behalf of a developer. I, no, nobody faults the man for wanting to make a profit on his, his property. <clears throat> but as it's been mentioned, the zoning was in effect when the property was purchased. It's, it, this is not a bait and switch. This was already known. When Mr. Levitt approached or appeared before the city council last month, his proposal was tabled. Among the comments were, that were made, Councilman Shakespeare stated that it was too dense and the number of units should be substantially reduced before bringing it back to the council. His newest proposal has reduced the total number of units from 144 to 133, which is an 8% reduction. And I appreciate those changes that he has made. And I can see that he's trying to make an effort, uh, but frankly, it's not just a matter of making the properties on Patricia Street look nice. Uh, it's about jamming 133 residences into a small space. In the previous meeting, arguments were made about providing more affordable housing in Santa Clara. With all due respect, the problem with this argument is that the city does not dictate the housing market. And we've already talked about that, so I'll, I can skip past a lot of this. But the cheapest units at the desert village townhomes that are being built across from Lava Ridge Intermediate right now are renting for $2,199 a month for a 1,500 square foot unit. And it's not because we don't have enough of those units. I mean, they could build a million more of those units. The housing market right now is dictating that that's just, that's what they go for. And they'll go for less when the housing market changes and when interest rates drop below 7.12%, which is where they're at today. Between Tuscany, Black Hawk, Desert Village, and the massive project being built on 400 East and Northtown Road, none of these have done anything to make housing more affordable. And I guarantee this project's not gonna make housing more affordable. It's, it is what it is. When my family purchased our property on Jacob Drive, we did so because of what Santa Clara was, not because of what it was gonna become later. I grew up here. This town was a place where people came to raise their families. It's where I've come to raise my family. These projects are rapidly turning this corner of my hometown into a place where people make no investment in the community and promotes a transiency that runs counter to 
what we're trying to protect. I just urge you to do nothing today. Just urge you, please don't vote to change the zoning. Thank you. <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me. This is not a place for applause. This is a place to comment and listen. Thank you. Well, can't they applaud me if I? No, sir. Oh, okay. Uh, I thank you for your time and your efforts. Sorry, here. can you state your name, sir? It's Art Pansing, 3866 Nicholas Drive. I'm on the east side there. One of, one of the things that I, I think that we have failed to talk about in this is, you know, we keep talking about 50% home ownership. Well, I've lived in, in, a, in a high rise that had 50% ownership. What happens with the other 50% is what you need to be talking about because inevitably they're, they're in it just for the money. And what happens every chance they get, they raise those prices. And your, your attempts at affordable housing go straight out the window. There isn't any, as long as you've got non-owner occupied, you don't have a prayer of keeping affordable housing there. So a couple other quick ones. One is I could, I could cry sitting here watching us talk about uh, Black Desert at 0.9 houses per acre versus 7.35 per here. It just, and the, the other thing is I, I uh, carefully researched what was going on in my neighborhood? I, I found that you know over in this area it was, it was single family housing, and I checked with the Washington County School Board to see what they were going to do, and they aren't going to do anything with their land in the near future, and so I bought my house, and I feel betrayed here. I think I think you know as, as one of our other people said, uh, the developer bought this knowing it was single family. And he should live with what he what he uh, what he bought. I'd like I'd like to live with what I bought. Thank you. Name is Fred Fargergun. Fred is fine. <laughs> uh, the Swedish name. Don't let that confuse you. I'm a fifth generation Utahn. I live at 2324 Bryson Circle. I've been there since 2002. Generally, I don't agree with everything that Warren Wright writes in Spectrum about his recent article about uh, growth machine in Washington County and St. George is very applicable to what we're discussing here. He quoted, and I would hear from History of Washington County by Doug Alder and Carl Brooks said the most current issue in limiting the influx of people who are drawn to the local lifestyle that we love here. If the um, graves of the pioneers could speak, they would likely warn about overburdening the land. My perception is that overburdening the land means to developers to get the most money possible for every acre. Well, I believe that the purpose of land is to, should be, the goal should be the best and wisest use for each acre. My specific points and recommendations, I object to the rezoning. Mr. Levitt mentioned in previous meetings and he did today, the need for a transition from the townhouses on the north, and so he needs some on the south. Most people know that the best transition point is a road, and Tuscany Road, Patricia Road, those are the transition zones that naturally occur in any community. There isn't a need for townhouses in a new portion of the development to provide for transition from another location off the side of the road. I suggest that they, um, I'd go back to the best and wisest use of this land would be for it to be, remain as currently zoned, single family homes. 
I would recommend that Nicholas Drive be continued across this property to, to 400 East, providing additional access and exit from that new development of single family homes and the existing properties. And that the properties between Pioneer Parkway and Tuscany Drive remain as single family homes. Thank you for your time. My name is David Pond. Uh, I live at 2322 Joshua Circle, uh, straight down uh, Nicholas Drive uh, from this. Um, at the April 12th council meeting, um, Mr. Levitt's application, and Mr. McNulty has been through this, his application was tabled. Um, the feedback from a couple of the members of the council stated that they wanted to see significant changes, uh, including the number of units reduced, as well as owner occupancy to the plan before they would approve or deny his application. There's three main points I'd like to address. Some of them have been addressed, but these are my words that I would like uh, to convey. Um, I'd like to point out that regardless of the increase to single family units and the reduction of multifamily units in the latest proposal, an overall reduction from 144 total units to 133 total units does not represent a significant reduction. One of the council members uh, stated he viewed a significant reduction would be somewhere in the 92 to 98 unit range, and that would be appropriate for this property. Other council members stated that they would like to see a design similar to Village on the Heights uh, directly to the south on, on Pioneer Parkway. Mr. Levitt, uh, that's my first point. This is my second point, Mr. Levitt has said multiple times in various meetings that the residents of the Heights do not want any development. This is a myth that is not true. We are not opposed to the development of single family homes. This is the last significant parcel on the northwest side of Santa Clara. This area has been inundated with three current townhome and apartment complexes in Tuscany, um, Black Hawk, and the development uh, north of Harmons, and uh, uh, further north on 400 East, uh, the new um, the new development that's going in there. Um, there's also three short-term vacation rentals uh, in the area. If there if there's a, a need, the the greater need is for single family unit single family homes in this part of Santa Clara, not more multifamily units. My last point, um, and this has been addressed in his latest application, but the owner occupancy of the units. Um, in his latest application, uh, he states that at least 50% would be owner occupied and it would be added to the CCNRs. However, um, as Mr. Entz uh, pointed out at the last uh, zoning meeting and a also at the city council meeting, there's nothing the city can do to enforce that. Multi-family units bring investors. Affordable housing is a relative term. What is, what is affordable for some is out of reach for others. Rents for all of these townhome and apartment communities are $2,000 or more. Single family homes are more likely to be owner occupied and bring people that are vested in the community. Thank you. Hello, Joshua Jackson, 3892 Nicholas Drive. Thank you. I wanted to bring up just a very practical consideration that needs to be dealt with, and that is parking. Now, not the parking, this is city code parking, but it's the reality. Where is the parking for the trailers, the longer trucks, the boats? Those that have done your diligence and, and checked out the site or looked outside any um, higher density, um, situation knows the line, the parking lot that the street becomes. The project as currently constituted still adds another 40% uh, or it's 140% growth to the current um, density or, or numbers. And this will take away much of the street parking while adding 140% or adding 60% um, to the people who need to park somewhere. So Tuscany will be gone. Um, the 
west side of Patricia will be gone. I am very grateful to have neighbors and driveways as opposed to walls and monoliths. So I'm grateful for that. But there goes that parking. Where do the boats and the trailers go? They go where our kids play. They go outside my yard and all the other yards. It's a very, if you've seen that, you know what I'm talking about. And that is a huge concern. Um, regarding the 50% owner occupied, whatever restrictions are placed, whatever is required, that has to have teeth. That's been brought up. I do not need to run that to the ground further. I do just want to read from the general plan. A lot of times I think that it's, it's believe that once certain things have been met, that the planning commission, the city council have to say to make approval. And indeed this is in the mid range of medium density, but I wanna read from the general plan. The city will consider granting higher density in a range relative to demonstrated significant public benefits. In most areas, the density designation may be considered an overall average, that's been done, to be achieved by using a mix of unit types and or lot sizes within the range. So far, so good. For example, in the medium density residential land use, the average of five units per acre could be achieved by mixing single family homes, duplexes, and even some townhomes. So just using the label medium density does not um, provide an automatic vestige of, of anywhere in that range. And even the example only takes it to five. Thank you. My name is Ann Evans. I live at 3772 Nicholas Drive. Okay, I walk every day. It's 612 steps from Tuscany Drive to North Town Road. That's about one tenth of a mile. And that one tenth of a mile, we've got Black Hawk, we've got Tuscany Rose, we've got Ocotillo Springs. That's 233 units combined. Now he states that they've done a traffic survey. How can you do a traffic survey when Quail Creek and Coyote Landing are not built yet? They don't know the impact of what's going to happen on 400 East. They don't know the impact of what's going to happen on North Town Road. Those are not built. That's 240 units. You're looking at roughly 500 more cars, 500 more people, plus Solus over on Rachel and Desert Village. They're still building. Desert Village is over 200. Solus is 184. You can't get the traffic impact there because they're, they're not done. They're not lived in yet. So he says a traffic survey, but I really can't. I can't go along with that. They've already discussed what happened at the April 12th city council meeting. And yes, Councilman Waite and the mayor suggested we go to a five to six density range per acre. They listed the village as the example. Now, um, I have a suggestion for Mr. Levitt. I understand he's trying to make a profit. I worked in business for 42 years. I get it. But if he can't make a profit from single family dwellings, then my suggestion is sell this property back to the city. The mayor is desperately looking for property for a new cemetery. Well, we all know at some point we're gonna need a place for repose. So I just want to kind of use a, a comment that Logan Blake used when he was running for city council in 2019. His comment was Santa Clara needs to be protected to maintain its small town feel, its walkability and its cycle ability. Please deny this spot rezoning application. Thank you. Hello, my name is Patricia Bauman. I live at 2304 Patricia Drive. Um, the, the thought that just keeps coming back to me is why do we need townhomes to transition to the townhomes that we already have? Someone's already mentioned that before. I really think we they this needs to be single family homes. We need single family homes. We don't need more townhomes. And what I appreciate on this drawing um, is or this plan is that there is not a road that comes out onto Patricia Drive. The traffic that we get already 
from Black Hawk and from Tuscany coming down Patricia Drive is a lot and it is fast. Um, so please don't put a road coming out on Patricia Drive as um, these plans hopefully will continue to evolve to single family homes um, because the traffic is already plenty busy for that short little street. Thank you. My name is Paul Steich. I live at 3895 Sweetwater Drive. It's it's a few blocks from this planned community. I don't have a problem with the planned community. What I have a problem with is when you have less than two thirds or even 75% absentee landlords. Uh, my wife and I moved here from another city, another state, where we've seen what happens when investors not property owners who have the vested interest in the property, rent their property out to people that, oh yeah, you can afford it. Okay, fine, we'll take the check. Here we go. I, I think that's a colossal mistake just coming from where we are from. It's a colossal mistake. Secondly, again, I need to echo something else a number of people have said. If the property was zoned a certain way, why are you changing that? Why, as an appeasement? Sorry, I don't buy that. And where we come from, shall we say there have been, and I certainly would not like to cast aspersions, but there's usually other reasons why it's approved like that. So, and I know that doesn't happen here, but I'm saying please do not allow this to happen. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm just starting to hear a lot of repeated stuff. Things, sorry. Um, if you have anything that hasn't been said, we'd like to. It's different. Okay. Um, Garrett Mayor, 2273 Julie Drive. Um, I just, and maybe I may not know, so educate me and feel free to comment. Um, I just, my curiosity is if this is rezoned and something comes up and Mr. Levitt needs to change everything and sell it, get out. Things happen, right? We have COVID, the un unknown, whatever it is. It's now rezoned and, and someone else just come in and do it whatever they want. That's, and I'm just asking that out there. So does it change things or does they have to follow this plan if he sells? They have to follow this plan. Okay. It's part of the approval. I just so want to make sure that that, make sure that's clear. Thank you. Hello, uh, James Thane. I live at 389 East, 1100 South in Ivins. So I'm right there across the street on the on the west side of this development. Um, the thing I wanted to, to bring up, and I know that there was a traffic study done inside of this property, but uh, from my experience being on the corner of that street and with the high density to the north of this property, that the road has gotten quite busy and like more busy than it should have been and probably was designed originally. So when adding even more high density, it is a concern for me, the neighborhood that I live in, because it is open to it, to have even more traffic and not be able to, to handle that many more people. So that's my concern. That's why I would rather it stay at the density that it's at. Thank you. My name is Jim Reynolds. I live at 348 East Desert Rose Way in Ivins, across to the west of this development. I've served on a planning commission at two separate terms, so I understand some of the things that you're dealing with. I was also a professional and civil engineer for over 35 years. So I've been involved with some development of various types. My first comment is number one, it is not appropriate to make a zoning change in a vacuum. If you notice the plan that's up there, there are single family dwellings to protect the residents of Santa Clara, but there's nothing along 400 East 
that will protect the single family units in the city of Ivan. Furthermore, we have only heard anecdotal evidence of the need for additional multi-dwelling units within this general area. As somebody mentioned before me, there are a number of developments, not only in Santa Clara, but outside of Santa Clara, where this high density multi-unit housing is going in, and we have no data to say that it's even necessary beyond what we already have. The third thing I would like to mention, and that is that the traffic study that was done to exit out of the units here is probably appropriate. But if you look at the intersection of Pioneer Parkway and US Highway 91, that, that intersection already is extremely difficult. With the expansion of old Highway 91 that's taking place now, more traffic will occur on that road. Unfortunately, that new construction does nothing to relieve any of the congestion or dangers associated with Kiner Parkway and the US 91 intersection. It will remain the same. And all of the traffic that's coming out of this proposed development is, will be impacting that particular intersection and making it worse. This is not transition zoning or building. This is in fact spot zoning. As mentioned before, there is plenty of transition for the multiple family to the north, which is what we're trying to transition from. Single family dwellings are on three sides of this property. It is inappropriate to provide spot zoning in this particular case. And I urge you to decline the request for rezoning this property, especially in light of your own uh, resolution, I think it was item C that you mentioned, there's no reason why single family dwelling cannot be continued on this unit. And in fact, it's probably the best use of this property. Thank you. Be brief. Ann Pritt, 3918 Madison Avenue, Village on the Heights. Um, I've watched with interest the development of the townhomes north of Harmons. I've watched their rents increase almost week by week, certainly month by month. When they started renting, uh, the cheapest units were around 1800 now the cheapest um, are listed at 20, but actually online they're listed at 23. People will rent for what the market will bear. It's, it really is a myth that townhomes provide affordable housing. Thank you. Resident of Ivan from 1107 South 375 East, right directly across from uh, this area. What's your name for the record? Dance Spray. And just really quickly, the 400 East, the, the traffic to me, I don't think it could ever handle that, plus what's coming up from the north, Arcadia. Uh, the bus stops right out front of where we are, and the kids <laughs> have. Half the time, have to run to get out of the way of traffic. Traffic along there is 45 to 50. It's supposed to be 25, but I very seldom see it go that slow. Uh, also, I live right on kind of on a hill where I can look at Snow Snow Canyon. I can look at it. I got the most beautiful view in Ivan's, I think, and I think it's going to go away. So that's a personal thing there. But the traffic is a big problem for me. And then me being buying my home the way I did where I did, I'd like to just leave it as it is, as a single family. Thank you.
Chris Reynolds, 348 East Desert Roseway in Ivins. This hasn't been brought up, but property values will change. Our family went through something like this 30 years ago in Layton, and 235 homes were put behind our 3,600 square foot home. Our property values declined in one day 30%. This will happen here. Do not rezone it. Okay, thank you for your comments. Um, and now we'll uh, we'll close the public hearing for that item and uh, allow for the applicant to respond to some of those. <clears throat> if you counted all your minutes, maybe then. Hey, let, let's not have the sniping back and forth from either side. Thank you. Um, the R110 zoning uh, is a holding zone uh, in Santa Clara. That's been acknowledged in, in public meetings. Um, if you look at the general plan, uh, we are needing to buffer, uh, just like on Pioneer, the roads aren't a buffer. There needs to be a buffer of uh, single family homes to the residents on Village on the Heights, which we've done. Uh, that was brought to our attention, and, and that's why there's a need for a buffering uh, to the uh, townhomes to the north along Tuscany Drive. Um, it's taught extensively about the importance of uh, density transitions uh, between neighborhoods, and this plan certainly does that. And when we bought the property, we knew that there was the higher density to the north, uh, the single family to the east, and the village on the heights to the south, which uh, I think we've accommodated uh, all the residents in our plan. There was mention about the parking with regarding to the boats, RVs, and trailers. Uh, our CCNRs will uh, state that that's not allowed within the streets are within the community. If so, those, those would need to be screened behind a, a, a fence. Um, and so for the most part, those won't even be an issue uh, for parking, those types of things in the neighborhood as they won't be allowed. Um, I think those, those are probably the key, key thing. Um, uh, most importantly is We've got to be realistic um, as far as, yeah, what's affordable. Right now, uh, we know that the federal government has raised interest rates, but it, when they come down, maybe instead of 7% down to, to 5%, uh, still going to be difficult to afford a 650000 plus home in Santa Clara. And uh, that's why we're doing similar to what has been done on Village on the Heights and the majority of our project, three quarters of our project uh, land is devoted to single family. So we'd hope you'd consider that in your, uh, in your voting process and appreciate your time and thank you. If you have any questions, we can answer. Okay. I do have a question. Um, the, the small single family homes, you have the ones that are detached, what's, which those are two-story? Typically, those would be two-story. And again, uh, 1,750 to 1,850 square feet. So like 1,800 square feet. So we're going to be tied into a price point that that's could be affordable. Yes. And then the units that are on the, so the, the ones that are front Patricia, they're going to be like, simple that you'd assume block walls around all those like lots yeah, or just like gonna, lots, yeah, right? It's gonna be a single family home. Um we're gonna have as stated in the narrative, we're gonna have five to six different elevations for single family home. And then the, the residents to the west on 400 east. Remind me again, the 400 east is how big a street? That's pretty large, right? Six yeah, it's 66 feet. So the traffic study that's been done has a has taken it into account that. Um, 
along yeah, with it my would new be parkway. classified as a collector on our correct. I believe, yeah. yeah. I think I was looking at Ivan's and they have it as like a minor collector or something. Yeah. It's like a, a larger yeah. road. And those units are all double fronting, so you'll have the privacy wall. Right. Everything blocked. And we talked to some residents in Ivan's and they preferred to have one story along there so it would not hurt their views. And, and there's going to be a privacy wall. It'll be enclosed and really won't. And the, the yellow them. units you show on the map, those are the one story ones you're talking about? Yes. They, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yes. And that is that the view shed that looks towards like Snow Canyon, I guess? Is that kind of the idea is put them there? Yeah, through yeah, through Snow Canyon, the red, you know, the red hills, the mountains, uh, that view corridor. Try to protect that. And I believe the, the comment that was about the the boats and RVs, that was, I don't know if that was your your boats and RVs or the RVs that are there already. So I know I noticed when we went up here, there was a few people that parked their trailers and stuff out there. Oh that's yeah. mostly on what's that road? I can't read it. Tuscany. Oh, Tuscany. Yeah, it's so empty on the one side. So all those driveways will stop that. But I guess the concern was that those people would migrate somewhere, which is well, possible. maybe they were concerned about people in our project migrating somewhere else. But um, you know, I, I drove through both neighborhoods today, uh, Village on the Heights and and Heights West, and uh, there were some trailers parked out, a few here and there, but um, and a lot of cars were on the public streets parked. Um, we want to encourage no parking on the public streets, you know, and no, no vehicles left over overnight. And so that will be enforced within our CCNRs. I don't, any other questions for Mr. Levitt? Discussion for the council or for the commission? You want me to dive in? Sure. I have a few concerns about this. I'll try to speak loud. But um, as I mentioned in our last meeting, I generally oppose um changes in zoning where the neighbors are opposed to that and uh i think there's some good reasons for that as i mentioned last time there was an empty lot across the street from my home that was zoned r110 and it was empty for about 10 years. And I often thought when I was on the planning commission, I thought, what if somebody turned that into a 7-Eleven right there in front of my house? And, you know, maybe 7-Eleven buys that. They want to do something really neat right there and build a cool 7-Eleven. I, I don't think that's appropriate. And, and I can see if there was a, a compelling reason, a couple of things that I wrote some notes down here. It says that there's a 50% that, that the CCNRs would limit 50% on specific properties. Uh, as I understood that, what it, the way it reads in there, it says on the multifamily townhomes. So that means a couple of things to me, which would maybe I didn't understand, but it looks like everything else is free game. So the, uh, the rest of it could be 100% rental because that limitation as we have it here, just shows it in the, uh, in the multifamily townhomes. I think the affordability issue, I mean, when I look at this, I think we have built a lot more homes in Santa Clara since I've lived here. And I haven't seen the prices get much more affordable. You know, this is, even if you look at, you. Mr. Levitt mentioned something between 350 and 650 for these homes. So say there's even, you know, even if you can get them for 400 as an average price on those, um, you know, that, I don't know if that's, if I would consider that affordable. I think the, um, the, the density is, it's just too dense. 
for what we're talking about. I mean, we went, like somebody mentioned, there's an 8% reduction. I did a little math on this here. You know, it goes from 7.96 to 7.35. Personally, I don't consider that a very significant uh, density reduction. And uh, I, I would just, I, I don't see anything here that's really compelling to change the way I voted on it last time. So I, I, I don't, I didn't, I mean, I can see that, you know, if you sell 133 of these things at 400 grand, that's $53 million. You know, that's a, that's a chunk of change. I'd be pretty motivated to change that as opposed to, you know, 70, 80, 90 units over there that, you know, five, 600,000, you know, maybe it's, there's some math there that, that could work out. So. Anyway, that's what that's pretty much all I have. When I knew this was coming back, I listened to the city council meeting and when I figured it was coming back, I really looked into this cuz I am similar to you that I usually oppose zone changes because of unless the the if it's going to be affecting the residents closely and they're not bought in and it just hasn't the meetings haven't been done it's it's really hard to change a zone as i started looking into this i i read our report and my opinion was changed because it's not my opinion on what's best for the residents that's the city council's job to and i think that was where i had to come to a a decision that it's not my decision to make a decision on what's best for the residents in that that's the city council they're the ones that are elected but as the the staff report says it says that our duty is to make sure the application is complete and it complies with the general plan which it does and forward a recommendation to the city council it doesn't say forward a recommendation to approve or deny it just says that's that's what our job is here to do today and so as I looked into that a little bit more, it changed my opinion on some things. Um, the density, I think an 8% density, it may not be a substantial number, but when you look at the 14% more single family lots, that's a huge number. I think that's a significant change. And then there's 14% less townhomes, not to mention the 10% less units. So, Overall, it's a 28% swing going from townhomes to single family lots. I would say that's a, a giant change in, in what the Levitts have done, and, and I appreciate that. I know they've discussed about possibly getting it zoned to R16, and if you do the math on an R16 zone, you're still seven units per acre, and that's about what we are with the way it sits right now. So I, I don't think that that would be accomplished anything um looking at the r16 i did look up in the general the general plan and there's a, an area in fact under what mr jackson read if he would have continued the next paragraph it says it's the density transitions to ensure that the new development is compatible with existing neighborhoods Gradual, gradual transitions between different densities should occur. For example, if a new development with a medium density designation, which this is, were placed next to an existing low density neighborhood, single family homes should be placed along the common boundary with duplexes and townhomes placed further away from the existing neighborhood. This will create a gradual transition of density away from the common property line and make adja adjacent developments compatible. I think the Levitts have paid attention to what the staff has recommended and the city council's recommended. And I think they've gone along with what the general plan has asked us to do. I know it was set up in 2014, but until it's rewritten, that's what we have to go by. And so I, my opinion has changed on my stand from last time. I just think that this is a decision for the city council to dive into as far as what the, the residents want. That's not a decision we make on our end. It is our, our call 
to have the public hearing though. Correct. Um, I, I was in favor of the project last time and um, I continue to be in favor of the project for the reasons that mostly Curtis listed. Um, the general plan calls for medium density um, and what they're requesting complies with that. Um, what it is complies with that too. So um, I would not change probably my vote from last time, my position. So my, my thoughts on it are, um, I, I was looking at looking at this area and this, this particular parcel was annexed into the city. You can find that in the county records in 1982. These, this area up in here was all annexed back in the 80s. So it's been part of the city for years. The previous owners that Mr. Levitt bought it from, I assume just used it for their farm fields. I think which are kind of still there. A lot of it was used for that grazing and, and sort of stuff, but you know, cities, cities evolve, vacant lots become different things. And I agree with brother commissioner call um, that you wouldn't, that you wouldn't take a, take a home in that and make it a seven 11. That's, that's too much ratchet. You need to, there needs to be an evolution, a slow ratchet of intensity. Like that, that became say a duplex or something would be more appropriate than jumping all the way to that. This, this to me is not a jump from the neighbors to something completely different. It's, it's a small tick that evolves through it. It's been buffered from the neighbors with the single family homes. Most of them are single family. The, the, I listened to the city council minutes and the stipulation was they were more worried about the attached units. That's why they won the stipulation of the 50% answer on the test. They figured that all the other ones that are they don't have yards, but some people don't want a big yard to maintain that just grows weeds and has to be deal with. So they want these, these single family kind of patio homes, they're 1800 square feet. I know there's a lot of units in the Heights in the older part of the Heights that are 1800 square feet, um, but they're on one level. Please would be too level, be a bit, that they'd be a similar size. So I, I don't see a huge difference between a lot of this and what's out there other than the amount of empty yard space, I guess you would, you would have, um, but that wouldn't, have, that doesn't affect the neighbors, the empty yard space within the development. Um, the roads around here have all been sized based on general plans between us, between Ivan's and that sort of thing. They're all, they're all huge collector roads, arterial roads that have been sized to handle this sort of thing. They don't, they might not feel like it now because they've been empty for so long, overbuilt, some of them are not are only half built. Some of them aren't striped to the full capacity that they are intended to be. And I'm sure that will evolve over time. Traffic studies do look at that. They project based on what's planned in the community, not what's already built, but they look at the future. They go on and that sort of thing. And so when I look at this, I still think in my previous thing that there is a need for this. I live in the old community. That's it's not my community wasn't built in 2020. It was built in 1970. And I, there's dozens of houses that have been adding ADUs and they're all full. They all have wait lists for affordable units and affordability is relative. All the homeowners expressed many concerns that they would lose their property value. So they don't want to, they obviously aren't going to sell their homes for cheaper. So why should anybody else or the, the people that sold this to Mr. Levitt, he, they, that family, wanted to get a fair price and what was the market would bear for their property. And that's kind of how things work. Everybody all has the same thing. Nobody wants to live under mob rule and have the community dictate what they can do with their house or how, you know, if everybody came and said, I want to vote and make your house pink, then you have to paint it pink. I don't think anybody would like that, but I, I just think far as the community goes, we as Santa Clara, we need to provide places for our kids to live or anybody for that matter. We, if you look at the, the growth in the whole state and for the whole Washington County for the past 10 years, we've been building at less than growth. And that's, it's just com compounded. There's many reasons why the houses are so expensive, but these are gonna be relatively cheaper than on our 110 lot. 
Um, and that's, that's what we're trying to shoot for is relative, relative affordability, trying to get more units available to the community. One, one evolution at a time. And this is one of the places we have left to evolve a lot of there's lots of places that um, are doing big lots. There's the, there's the black desert thing. That's all one acre. There's half acre lots that are being built in the Valley um, or across the river. There's a, there's a lot of places for the other type of units. And, and this is one place that was designated in the general plan by the community in, in 2014 to have this type of product. Um, here and and I and Mr. Levitt could build R110 lots and still make a profit. I know they could because they could sell them for quite a bit of money. And so I, I think this is this is fulfilling a need. This is fulfilling a market that's not being fulfilled throughout a lot of the community. Um, that's why you're seeing high rents is because there's there's scarce scarcity in inventory. But I like it because it has single family homes that will look like it. Everything else is buffered by big roads. All out of the other sides, it's it's there's transition to the other communities, um, and it provides a need for the community. And that's why that's why I'm still in favor for it. I like that there's that they've added the the pedestrian connectivity, that there's narrow streets that are safer, that provide for walkability with the sidewalks. Um, there's the trail that provides walkability. Um, it to me it it's what we need in the community and it just, it fulfills a need. That's why I'm, I'm faithful for it. I'm, and like I said, what Commissioner White has said, it's, it's our responsibility as a plan commission to take the information before us. Does it meet the intent? Does it satisfy transitions? Does it fit the neighborhood as far as being going from a single family home to a 7-Eleven? This doesn't jump that high. This is a, this is a gradual increase across the board to similar uses, um, but providing those smaller footprints, less yard to maintain for a different market. We're trying to get variety in our community of, of people. And I mean, that's just how, that's just what things we need to look for and people build what, what they're allowed to build. And that's what you need to move forward. That's, that's my feelings on it. Well. Wow. Any, any more discussion? Just a, a, another question. So once we vote on this, uh, Mr. Entz, this goes to city council, is that right? That's correct. Once you have a recommendation that can be forwarded on to them. Yeah. Okay. And then or, they're the ones that ultimately make the decision, right? That, that's correct. And because this is a, because this is a zone change, a zone amendment, it is a, it's a legislative decision. Mm -hmm. Um, it's one that, and, and I know we've talked about this before, so I'm sorry you have to hear it again, but it's, it's a decision that the city council has broad discretion as to what they consider because it has to do with, you know, the, the, the direction of, of, uh, development of the city and it, and it has to do with, you know, concerns and considerations of the, of the residents, um, and property owners that we've heard from tonight. So, um, yeah, the the planning commission's role is to make a recommendation and and uh, to make a record of everything that's been said tonight for the benefit of the city council and and then they'll make make the final decision. But, Thank you. And your recommendation is not binding on them. You know, they can they can take your recommendation or they can go a different direction. So. Thank you. Have you guys seen the the things that Ivan C's been doing with the with the talkabouts? Have you heard of those that they've been having? I haven't. Ivan's is looking, and we're, they're in a similar boat to us. They have a lot of, they're mostly single family. And they had a discussion, I think back in April, about just economics of a city and, and single family homes. And if you keep building them, what the future looks like. And it, it was quite, it's quite eye-opening. Um, you can go watch it on their website, but I recommend it to, to a lot of people, the discussion. I did look at the exact date of it, but it was pretty cool. It was or pretty good to watch. I'll look for a motion, I guess. I'll make a motion. I move to recommend to the city council to approve the rezoning from R110 to PDR, Plan Development Residential, of the 18.09 acres on the corner of 400 East and Pioneer, subject to the discussed 15 conditions. Second. 
We've got a motion from Commissioner Whitehead and a second from Commissioner Harris on that motion. Any questions on the motion? No? Okay, let's do roll call, starting with Commissioner Call. Nay. Commissioner Blake, aye. 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 Uh, motion passes three to one for the recommendation. Okay, moving on to item, see now we're down to item three or 4A3, consider a proposed code amendment to the Santa Clara City Zoning Ordinances, section 17.18. Logan, can I, before oh. you move on, can I just make one comment just for the benefit of those that were here? I just wanted to say, we do appreciate all of the comments that are offered. I, I know that sometimes I, I can be a little firm in my comments, but um, the purpose of that is so that everybody has a chance to be heard and appreciate your respectful feedback and input. Um, it is welcome and it does become part of the record. And the, yeah, and these go forward to city council, the, all the public comments that will be. Yes, be they will have a the, copy the of council the record. And, for their meeting, they'll have a copy of the proceedings. And these meetings, these meetings are posted to YouTube too, aren't they? They are. Yep. So they you are. can go back and listen to them and the council. They can go back and listen tonight or tomorrow morning. I generally do that. It's my <laughs> Friday morning review what would transpire, you know, what went with planning commissioner city council at the end of the week. So yes. All right. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Back to Another working agenda, the public hearing for, is this, is this a public hearing for the item four? It is. A3A? Yeah. Consider a proposed code amendment to the Santa Clara Zoning Ordinance, Section 17.18, Amendments to Land Use Ordinance, Zoning Map and General Plan. Um, this includes the General Cleanup and Updating Ordinance. I'll turn the time over to Jim for the presentation for this. Thanks, Commissioner Blake. Um, this is an item that we did have a brief discussion with the Planning Commission uh, during a work meeting on April 13th. We've also had discussions with the City Council on this. Um, it is a public hearing. Um, I don't know if we'll have any interested that want to comment to the item as it's a text amendment to the development code. Basically, we're adding general plan amendments to section 1718 100. Um, and so if you go to that specific language, this is just a cleanup of the title, but that the, the majority of the code amendment, uh, well, 90% of it, 99% of it is the cleanup to the language. And um, if I can go here, I'm sorry, it's the addition of general plan amendments. See, it's the addition of a new section 1718-100 for general plan amendments. And so the proposed wording is as follows. The general plan may be amended from time to time by the city council. General plan amendments will be considered on a quarterly basis by the city. All proposed amendments shall be submitted first to the planning commission for consideration at a public hearing. The city council shall consider the recommendation at a public hearing and make a final determination to adopt, modify, or deny the proposed amendment. Item B, for a general plan amendment, which includes a rezoning of property and a required project plan to a plan development PD zone, the general plan amendment may include a condition that the rezoning application on which the general plan amendment is based must be approved within a certain timeline or the property reverts to the general plan prior to approval of the amendment. So that's the key. That's the language that Matt and I have developed for this particular code amendment we're wanting to add this at this time as you know the city has seen a big increase in general plan amendment applications and rezoning applications it's not uncommon um, to review them on a quarterly basis so that means we would look at general plan amendments in january we look at them in april if we have applications we'd look at them in july and then we'd look at them in october so on a quarterly basis, rather than ju them just submitting and, and coming to us kind of whenever they would like to propose a general plan amendment. So it's putting some uh, limitations on it, letting them know that it is a big deal to amend the general plan. It's not just a simple application and this is the direction we'd like to go. And so we did post this, uh, we meet all state statute requirements for a code amendment. 
and city staff does recommend that the planning commission hold a public hearing and consider forwarding a recommendation of approval for this code amendment to the city council. So that's all I have on this item. Matt and I are here to answer questions of the planning commission and you can open it to the public. Uh, sorry, you are required to open it to the public as it's a public hearing, but it, this is this is the modification. Which so, is so basically this is just to, we were allowing general plan amendments whenever they came up and this is to only allow them on a quarterly basis. That's the idea behind this. Correct. Does this also include splitting them, making them separate things requirement? Is that, I don't, is that part of this or is that separate? I don't remember reading that. Do you want me to comment on that? We've essentially made that the policy now of, of, of these applications. When we get an application for a general plan change and a zone change, generally we're, we're now scheduling those so that the general plan approval goes through first. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's a couple reasons for that. But one is, I mean, one is really just um, to, because those are, two different types of decisions. It, it just seems to be helpful both for the applicants and for the city to, to just do them separately. Whereas in the past, we've allowed them to go through in parallel. Um, so that's kind of already happening. This is not necessarily to implement that, but it, it definitely will, you know, continue because of the quarter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a zone change application won't be limited at all, but but those general plan applications will only be able, able to be considered each quarter, so. Okay, um, any other thing? Um, with that, we'll open the public hearing for this addition to the code and um, the clean up language as well. If anybody has a comment for this particular item, they can come to the microphone. Sorry to be such a past. Evan Ferguson, 3790 Nicholas Drive. I did have a question in regards to the certain timeline that has to be a response by. With it not being designated as a certain timeline, we run into problems like tonight's meeting with, with the public um, being busy with graduation. Timeline, timeline to what, sorry? Um, with readdressing approvals, I think it was. This is a different, this is a different issue. Here. Uh, there, there was something on there that said that. Oh, you're talking about if somebody is denied and they want to come back in again? Correct. That's, that's not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right there. It's a certain timeline at the very bottom. The second oh, line. I, the, I see what you're saying. Yeah, at the very end. Yeah. Okay, so if we can shorten that time period to where it doesn't conflict with, with what they call them, snowbirds, people that come and go with the season, uh, there's a lot of people that could have been tonight's meeting that would have hopefully swayed the way the vote went tonight. We had nice attendance and that meeting in March was well People I know as that well. would have been impactful, couldn't make it tonight. So. We also received emails from many that were forwarded to the planning commission. So right. that couldn't be here this evening. And unfortunately, we didn't have you as a salesman selling the project either. So what's that? We didn't have you supporting us as, as residents that were concerned. You were busy selling the project. So I was selling the okay. project. To the yeah. It I, always I, goes that way. I'm that's honest. not right. Yeah, Devin, I... <laughs> Respectfully, I disagree with that characterization. I mean, Jim works hard to present these projects in a fair way, and I will defend him on that. So, and it's always to their benefit. It always is. He judged. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get argued. Yeah. He transitions into talking about the project to beautiful these. Okay, projects. that's this is this is not related to this. Yeah, so I understand. Your, your, time, your timeline question on that is if if a general plan is is approved and nothing happens if it sits vacant say like they don't do anything with it like for a year or two then it reverts back to the way it was before right. it doesn't yeah. doesn't nothing to do with like noticing or letting people come and, and talk to that's a different that's state code that has those sort of those sort of requirements i believe certain timeline is still too vague so i think it should be designated a certain a real timeline that's all i have to say do we do we address the timeline of like when it goes reverts back in the code somewhere else uh no this is new this is new so i mean what, the like i agree with that statement what what would be the certain what would be the timeline like was it a year or two years yeah isn't that isn't that in here jim i'm sorry i don't have this right in front of me so well, i'm gonna read it on the screen i i don't recollect i know if a rezoning of property is denied 
they have to wait 12 months to sub resubmit that same application or they can submit a new application. I think it would be feasible that we would put one year here as well. Because a preliminary plat approval, like the one that was approved for Black Desert tonight, that's good for two years for them to proceed. I think one year is plenty here. Yeah. You know, if, if they can't make the decision within that time period, then it goes back or can't move it forward. I think that's very reasonable. So we could just uh, kind of add that on to our, our recommendation to the city council. Is that what you're thinking, Jim? Be specific with the expiration timeline. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Just we have Miss Walton with us this evening. She's waited a long time. I assume she's here to discuss this. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Is there any, anybody else that would like to speak on this? Well, I guess not. So we'll close the public hearing on the code amendment for an item dash four dot four a three, and then move on to the general business to to discuss it and um make a recommendation for this this code amendment i i i didn't see anything i most of it is clean up and i good with the quarterly thing i think that's that's fair to have them every quarter um i think it's, and that's i think it's a good frequency too like jim says if not it gets kind of hodgepodge where you don't know it's like every third meeting we have one kind of a thing right yeah, we've had quite a few and we realized that we need to commit some time to our general plan. It was adopted in 14 and amendments were made in 17, but there isn't budget allocated this year and perhaps next year we'll start working towards that, but we don't have the funds at this point in time. Yeah, I think it's good. Yeah. I don't, and you may have said this before, Jim, uh, partly this was prompted by some conversations with St. George City. Yes. Right? They've yes. actually done something similar recently. Um, and it seems to be they you know it seems to be working well for them you know the the only drawback i can see to it is um you know you may have a a property owner who is raring to go and they'll just have to wait till the next quarter to put their application you know have their application and i asked with. about that and that's a good comment and <laughs> and, and saint george I, I know a few guys that work over there they work up north like i did and and a gal at one time and they're down here they said generally once the word gets out, it's pretty good. You know, people understand it's a quarterly yeah. thing. So submit in March, we'll go in April. Yeah. Type of thing. You know, yeah. it's not unreasonable. Yeah. So but I think the flip side of that too is it 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 definitely allows Jim more time to do what he needs to do on these uh types well, of applications. It, from as it if if it's known up up front and you're looking at purchasing a property or something, you're gonna know that it's gonna take you a little bit longer. To go through the process, as long as it's as long as it's consistent, you know about it, it, you can work around it. You know most people. So, and ninety days doesn't sound unreasonable for a general plan modification. If I were a property or a rezoning, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's not. Yeah, three to six months is the norm to go through those processes. Yeah, in bigger cities, it could be a year. Yeah, so I think it also I, I think it also communicates that. A general plan change is a big deal. Yeah. You know, whereas in the past we've kind of treated it as just part of the process of a zone change. You know, and it and it's not really the same. Yeah. So yeah. I'll look for a recommendation. I'll recommend that we propose this code amendment. Uh this goes to the city council, right? It does. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. Does. that we propose to the city amendment. council that they make this uh, code amendment to our zoning ordinance, section 17.18, about the amendments to land use ordinance, zoning map, and general plan. And uh, that we set that timeline as one year. Yeah. Yeah. You can include that as part of your. You look like you were going to recommend something else to me, Mr. You, that's what I was going to say. Oh, okay. You got there. Okay. Thank you. I was That's my recommendation. Me, yeah. <laughs> second. Got a motion from Commissioner Call and second from Commissioner Harris. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, looking through the next item, we have item seven, the approval of, of the regular minutes from the April 27th, 20, 2023 meeting. Um, 
Yeah, it looks good to me. I didn't see anything. Okay. Yeah, I think they look good, so. I can make a motion to approve the minutes from the previous Planning Commission meeting. To approve, if, did I say that? Make a motion to approve the minutes from the previous Planning Commission meeting. I'll second that. Get a motion from Commissioner Whitehead and second from Commissioner Call. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Minutes are approved. Um, Jim, you had mentioned that we don't have funding to do the general plan. Did, didn't I hear at a meeting that we were awarded some funds? I don't know if that's the case. I'll have to ask the city manager. I hasn't. I haven't been told that. So do you remember yeah, do you remember grant. when it was oh a grant? I don't know. I mean, the fact of the matter is we just got wrapped up the city alliance, which was taking a lot of our time with Utah Technical College. They wanted to help us there, but they don't have the expertise. They don't know how to amend a general plan. Usually you hire a consultant that does this for a living full time. They they do general plans. What I've Propose is it would be a 50 50 effort where I would try to do half of it in house with a consultant helping and guiding that does this every day <laughs> throughout the year. And a lot of the consultants have 20, 30 years of experience. So we would try to do it at 50% of the normal going rate. But I haven't heard much back on that. If we've applied for a grant, I don't know. I'll, I'll find out. And perhaps we yeah, have. Yeah, and, yeah. and perhaps yeah. a council person has applied for one, but I'm not in that loop uh, we got some help from utah tech through the city alliance but the general plan was not one of them they don't have the expertise so i'll see what i can find out good question and a question i have on the general plan is we're just about build out other than the south hills mm -hmm. why do we because isn't the majority of the project being to amend you know we know it's happening down there at least to a point that's just a small fraction of the general plan but it, is it a big project where everything north of Santa Clara Drive is pretty much built out? Well, it still is. I mean, we need to, there's a lot to it. And yeah, I'm not an you, expert. That might just be the map, but you could yeah. also dictate how you do infill and that's so a lot of like the design things and what what you want to do and with your the commercial rest. stuff could change. Okay. There's a lot of things we could determine more with the annexation boundaries as well. Future growth areas, you know, there, there's a lot still at play. We still have all the South Hills, you know, that's undeveloped. We have black desert is the PDR and medium density. Is that exactly right? Or should we make some modifications and changes? We have these two huge master plan areas that will contribute to our growth quite a bit in the next 5, 10, 20 years. Yeah. And really, the city is master planned at some point through our public utilities and others where we could approach 20,000, and we're only at about half of that now. So there still is a potential, even though there's a lot of build out in areas that where development potential isn't there, there are areas where it could still develop. Yeah, and that, so we need to look at it. Yeah, I was just going to say, too, you know, even if even if every property in the city is developed, that doesn't preclude redevelopment. Right. Yeah. You know, that's what, and yeah. so. And that's city, a huge just, thing. Yeah. And for a mature a city, that like, becomes yeah. a lot of what you're dealing with. Right. Yeah. So, redevelopment is a huge thing. And do we ever get into the RDA business and all of that? There's a lot of things at play here. So what business? Redevelopment agency. Oh, okay. We're small. I don't see us doing that, but we could do a little bit of it. And it could be a joint effort between us and Ivan's. I just don't know. Right. Because Ivan's could grow to be 20 plus thousand as well. And so the two communities together could be over 40,000 at some point. Right now we're around 20. Right. And so someday we could double that. I guess that statement shows my simple mindedness on <laughs> No, no. We've had the same question come out at the council level, and we just have to make sure it's done right. You know, right. we don't want a big consultant to come in and do all this stuff and send us some huge bill, but we do need some guidance right. and some help. So you're efficient, Curtis. That's yeah. what it is. You're efficient. Yeah. Well, I don't want to sell us short as a community. We need to get it right. 
Is there anything else needs to be brought before the commission? Just that we'll see you in two weeks on June 8th. Uh, we've got a couple items and then we'll have some discussion items as well that are needed. Uh, Cody Mitchell had a discussion on building height uh, with the city council last week during a work meeting. So we wanna continue that discussion. And then we wanna have a general discussion on accessory structures in the city height, size, scale, setbacks. Uh, you know, we've got some things we need to discuss and some potential changes. So we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. With that, we'll close this meeting and adjourn for until the next one in two weeks. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good evening. Okay. Twenty seconds. Okay. Okay. Oh, what? He'll be gone on the 22nd. Yeah. Let's see if I can get it. <laughs> Thanks. Your arm. Letting us know. No, it's not just eating cereal anymore. Oh, off the recording. No.